so Jesse, welcome to the uh, welcome to the channel. You and I haven't actually had a chance to debrief about the race. It's now March 31st. We're months after the Moab 240. And of course, you took the win. I wasn't too far behind you in second place. We had an epic battle at the finish. And this is the first time we're actually going to get a chance to talk about it. So so welcome. It's great, great to connect. Oh, I'm so glad that you uh, put this together and, and are interested in going through it because, yeah, we did not really i mean we talked at the finish line but i don't remember yeah. much of it i can't recall much of that conversation at all we talked for maybe a half an hour or an hour we kind of we hung out for a bit but i thought i think i just assumed you would be there the next day um you know we finished a couple of days before the finish before the awards and you, you obviously had to take off and get back to work or or whatever other commitments you had right so I, I think I went and I had a nap for a few hours and the next morning when I got up, you were gone and I was like, damn, I should have, I should have <laughs> stayed up and partied with you. So that was my bad. But uh, yeah, so you and I did uh, chat for a bit to arrange this call and, and we got to know each other a little bit and we really had to like hold off on getting oh, into yeah, the meat yeah, of yeah, the race, sure. right? Because we really want oh, to jump yeah. into it. And we're like, no, let's keep it fresh for this conversation. <laughs> so, so yeah, so everyone watching, this is going to be, you know, the first time we run through this and really debrief and hear the race from each other's perspective. Yes. Having said that, you did, Jesse, just watch the film along with everyone else. This film, um, once as this is published, the film will have been published as well. So you'll have kind of seen my perspective. So mostly this is a chance for me to hear from you. So first of all, congrats again on your, on your race. Congrats again on the first place uh, at Moab 240. Um, what were you expecting going into that, going into the race? What were you hoping for? Well, let me first say thank you for the congratulations, but the, the, uh, the, the, not that we're not going to get into it, but your finish in second place was stellar. Crazy. Uh, what were my expectations? Well, I originally, um, I went into it just wanting to make sure that I could cover the distance and sort of mainly enjoy the surroundings and that's kind of why I do um, the long distance races is I like to see different parts of the country, different, you know, the, pretty much just the course. I, I, I do, I do races mainly for just to see the courses. Obviously yeah. I'm competitive. So I also have that aspiration to finish well, but mainly it's just to push myself to see how good I can do. It's not really getting into it to try to beat, beat everybody that's there. Um, so the aspirations going into it was a, be able to cover the distance. Cause I had never gone more than 208. I think I did Bigfoot was somewhere around there. So 250 was, uh, the next, the next step up. So that was the main reason. And then obviously I've done a number of races in my running career and, yeah. I finished well in a lot of them, so I did have aspirations of possibly winning. Um, I didn't. I didn't look into the. I looked at the race entrance a few times, but it was never like. I never like scrolled through and checked, checked the boxes of what everybody's done during their races. I was just looking for familiar names or people that I had, you know, competed against before, and I, I didn't see a whole a whole lot of names on there. So I was, I, I went in it with not a real set plan as to, you know, what place I wanted to come in. I did have a finish time okay. uh, in mind. What, what um, can I ask what that was? The finish time was six, 60 hours is what I wanted wow. to do. Okay. Now that was probably based on the old course though. Hey, it was they, based on yeah. the old course because uh, I have a list also of my aid stations that I, yeah. <laughs> that I did. And um, I think I had, I was going to finish, let's see, 10. Yeah, I don't, I don't have, really have it written down. I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I, I do know it was somewhere around the 60 hour range is what I really wanted. But yeah. obviously I didn't know what I was going to get into when I started. So, so the old course was, um, was it eight or 12 miles shorter? I can't remember it now. Was 12 miles shorter. 12 miles shorter. So yeah. the old course, I think the Moab 240, the intent was always for it to be a 240 miler. But over the years, because of, I think, uh, permitting or weather, landslides, GPS issues, even whatever it is, the course ended up closer to like 228. 
And then, so this year they wanted to make it right. They added a whole 12 mile section. Yeah. I'm not sure. Was that the section in, around Shea Mountain maybe? It was. It was. Yeah. So used to go some different direction. You never went up and over the, the highest portion of that range. Yeah. So quite a bit of elevation gain as well was added and yeah. altitude, like you got up over 10,000 feet. So that was, that was a tough section they added. They were estimating originally, I believe, six to eight hours additional time. And I think we saw it was probably on the on the upper end of that, maybe eight to 10. Although, yeah. and we will get into this, I know your result, while amazing, probably you were affected, your lungs, your breathing, you probably didn't run as, that. yeah, you probably didn't run as fast as you could have. And on that note, I want to just point out, so Jesse, you, you, you had never been on my radar. I, I'm not, I mean... I don't know every runner in the sport, but I, I hadn't heard your name before. And since running with you, I know a lot of runners who've been around the sport for a while definitely know your name because you have some amazing results. Your ultra sign up is like 15 years of first, second, third at almost every race you've run. So you have some amazing results. I just want to make sure I point that out. <laughs> this was your race to win, I think, or your race to lose, however you want to put that going yeah, into this. So, it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this was definitely so. So we'll get into that, but I just want to make sure if you're curious, search for Jesse Haynes on Ultra yeah. Sign Up, and you'll see what I mean. There's there's an amazing resume there, but also you're 50 years old now. So the fact that you're still performing so well, like you're still, it feels like at the peak of your running career uh, as an aging athlete, like that's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I don't really ever look at my age. Uh, the age number, I just, you know, it's still working for me. I don't know. I don't know when that'll subside or start to go in reverse, which I, it may have already. <laughs> I'd have to do a couple more races uh, based on, you know, my other finish times at those particular races. Sure. I always have Western States as a, or I always had Western States as a parameter of, you know, my fitness level. Um, yeah. That was your benchmark. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and obviously 50 K distance, uh, races, you know, I'm seeing my times start to get a little bit slower on the same courses, but you know, it's always about what, what's going on for that day. And yeah. so I, I don't really look at my age as, as being what it, what it is just because I've, I've been able to, I guess, keep, keep it going. I got yeah. a buddy that everybody not everybody, but a lot of people know Jeff Browning also. We've been friends for, you know, over around 10, 12 years, something like that. And he is also in that in that range of, you know, that, that age and still able to make it happen in the sport. So I don't really look at it as a, a age as a number. It's just able to keep going. It might be, it might be diet, it might be genetics. Who knows? Well, you're doing something right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, let's get into it then. So when did you show up for the race? I was there weeks early and I arrived at the camp a few days early, like, cause we, we were living and breathing this event. Whereas for you, I mean, you work in construction and you know, you have a busy life. I'm assuming you probably rolled in what a day early. Yeah. If we want to go just a little bit further back, I didn't, I, I knew I was in the race because I was in the race the previous year and I knew that I had, I wasn't going to be able to run the race last year. I mean, the, the previous year because I had a broken foot and missed Western States because of it. And then trying to get healed up, I wasn't able to heal in time to do the race. So I ended up volunteering at, at the 240 at, at Dry Valley Aid Station um, and was able to, to get my entry into the race back. So I was able to do it the following year. But what didn't happen is I didn't fully explain that to my wife. <laughs> she ended up signing up for Kodiak 100 um, early in the year last year, and she didn't even realize that I had planned on doing Moab. So I felt a little guilty because she's always at my races and crewing me. And so I felt a little guilty that I was going to go do another race, and she had signed up for it on the same exact weekend. So I was like, nah, I think I'll I'll just, you know, resend my, my entry, and I'll you know, help you. Yeah. It wasn't like till I think it was a month before I finally decided I was like, Nope, I'm doing, I'm doing Moab. I was like, I'm 50. 
I might never have the 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 right circumstances where I'll be able to do the race again. Sure. I said I'm in already. I don't want to waste the money. So about a month out, I decided I was going to actually do it. So I was scrambling to find a place to stay and and all that. So now backing up to what when did I actually arrive? That's I don't want to get too much into it, but that's kind of a a, a good story as well because I planned on leaving. Uh, Wednesday morning really early and going to driving halfway to get to Flagstaff to stay at Jeff's Browning's house mm -hmm. um, and then drive the next half the next day to get to check-in which is Thursday we had to mm -hmm. check in Thursday well I, I ended up because of work and stuff I, I didn't get my drop bags ready in time because I did the race with no crew yeah. and had plans to do one a pacer for one of the sections but um, I didn't have a crew, so I had to do all drop bags at the aid stations, and I had ten drop bags, and it was just that's the that's the worst part for me for racing is trying to get my drop bags together. I get a headache from thinking about what I need because I have I'm kind of a linear person. I have to yeah. go aid station to aid station and put the what get that aid station done, and then we'll move on to the next one. So I have to make a big long list, and everybody probably does the same thing, but. Uh, it, well, it's hard to be, it's hard to be flexible with drop bags, right? Because once you use it, it's gone. Like you can't, yeah. you know, whereas with crew, you can say, Hey, here's my headlamp, charge this, give it to me at the next one. Like you can That's really right. troubleshoot with crew, right? That's um, right. Now, Jeff Browning was at the race though, helping you, I know at a couple aid stations, but that was, I guess, unofficial. Hey, like he wasn't it was, really, it was totally yeah. unofficial because he actually had an athlete that he was paid or crewing for, for the okay. entire, entire event. So the, he did show up at two aid stations which we'll get into later, one of them being a crux uh, spot for the aid station. And then the other one was the second aid station. He was there at that one just because his runner was going to be there within the next hour or so, and he was there, so he helped me out. But, yeah, getting the drop bags together, I had to go through and make sure that I looked at the temperatures for, the, for what time of day I was going to be there. So mm -hmm. first you have to figure out how long it's going to take you to get to every aid station. Right. Yeah. You had to do the same thing because you need yeah. to know what you're going to need as far as clothing goes. Yeah. Is it day? Is it night? Is it desert or That's mountain? That's right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then I had to figure out how much, how the distance between the aid stations so that I knew how much water to pack. Um, the fluid uh, electrolyte drink that I have uh, is called fluid, <laughs> but um, it's, I, had, I needed to know how much I needed to take with me because some of them are you know, no crew aid stations and I needed to make sure I had my calories. So it's a big, it's a, it's a big ordeal to try to figure out what you need at each aid station. So with that said, I didn't have it ready before I left Wednesday morning at like four in the morning. I wanted to miss traffic. LA is terrible for traffic and I was taking that route. So I decided, you know what, I'll just pack my drop bags and leave later in the day and, and, and leave after traffic. Um, so as I'm doing my drop bags, I didn't get them finished before 10 a.m. That's the time I had to leave to get to Jeff's in time to get some sleep, to get up the next day early to get to the race site. So I get to Jeff's thinking, I'll just do it at Jeff's house. Well, we got to talking. I didn't do it that night. And then the next day I woke up, I was like, I'll just pack everything in my drop bags before I get to the race site at Jeff's house. Well, we again, we were like, you know, in, I'm in his house and we're like talking back and forth and I wasn't getting it done. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to throw everything in my car. I'll figure out what I need as I'm driving. And I'll, I'll write down every aid station as I need. I got five hours. So I got to the race camp or base camp site at 30 minutes before you had to be checked in. So 4.30 PM, you had to be checked in by five with your drop bags in, in your drop bag locations at five. So I get to the parking lot that's across the road, and I threw everything out of my car, 10 drop bags on the ground. I'm throwing stuff in every single one of them, trying to get it done in a half hour. And if you ask my wife and a bunch of people that have crewed for me, I'm, I'm a bit of a, a, a nightmare when it comes to what I need. <laughs> I need yeah, everything, of, is what they say. Yeah. So I'm trying to get all this stuff together. So I got there at 4.30, had everything in my... In, I'm carrying 10 drop bags across the road because they don't let you park. And I get in there and I'm like, where do you put the drop bags? So I got checked in like maybe two minutes before check-in time, five, like 
458 and had it all in there and done. Um, all checked in, but yeah, I, I was there Friday or Thursday, 5 p.m. is when I got checked in finally. So you you hadn't really been planning on running this race until you said like a month out, but you had been training or? Yeah, I trained for it. Like, were you training for a different race? Maybe, you know, like no, what were you? No, no, I wasn't planning on doing any other different race. So I'd have to look back to see what my training was like. Yeah. But I know I did a couple 30 mile runs and, you know, I usually okay. do back to backs like Saturday, yeah. Sunday, long miles. And I did, I did a number of those type of uh, okay. training days, but my training really was not, you know, super, super rigorous and not wow. a high volume. I could look back at my, all of my training log is on Strava. Okay. And somebody just asked me yesterday about it. He's like, yeah, I look at your, at your training. It's like, you don't really train that much. Uh, and the the one thing that is missing from Strava is my races. So I don't wear a watch when I race. I don't listen to music when I race. And so if you go back and look at my Strava, the, the training that I did was exactly what I actually did for training. I, I actually did some speed work for Moab, if you, if you could believe it, because um, I needed to get my, my running yeah. legs on. You, you live in between San Diego and LA, so I'd imagine you're always running in warm, if not yeah. hot weather. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't doing any heat training. I did, I saw the forecast for it, whatever you can do, mm -hmm. like maybe a week and a half to two weeks out. And it looked like yeah. it was going to be pretty timid. Um, yeah. I, so I didn't I mention this in the film. Year. I didn't mention that in the film, but it was a cooler year. I mean, it was still warm, but it wasn't like desert hot. At least right. I didn't find it. You know, I, I, I remember kind of joking like that heat training I did was probably a waste. Like, you know, <laughs> the altitude I think, I think was... Waste. Well, maybe not. No, and it does help with blood volume. There's other benefits, yeah. but I mean to say, um, I think I think the elevation and the altitude change throughout the race was the bigger variable this time, yeah. rather than the heat. I think because there were lower, uh, our higher DNF rates this year than normal. Hey, yeah. So um, I don't. I don't know if it's because of so. So the heat wasn't really hot, but the cold was cold. Yeah. So there yeah. was a At big night. differential in temperature. I think we had a couple times that were like 70 somethings i'm not sure what that is in celsius but it was it was oh, okay it was there was ice on shea mountain like there yeah. was yeah snow and there was there was the water was freezing so it was definitely just below if not right around freezing level yeah um huh. and so because of the temperature extremes your body is trying to adjust for all that so the, the temperature did did have an effect on people i believe and the, the mm -hmm. cold cold is for me cold is almost like worse than hot because you have to dress yeah. um your dress. body's burning a lot of calories to warm yeah. itself right to and regulate then, and then if you get to the yeah. point where you can't run fast enough to keep your body warm then you're getting to the freezing zone mm -hmm. and then, and then yeah. everything just starts slowing down so mm -hmm. so well let's yeah. let's get more into that into the race here let's let's so we we started on the friday at noon so was, this was another change this year they usually start in the evening, I think, around 6 p.m. And this time they started at noon. So all of the, you know, where you'd normally be at night versus the day, that all kind of shifted as well this year. So I think even for the volunteers, they weren't quite sure, you know, how much water do we need at some of the aid stations? And um, so so that was different. For me, I love a noon start, though. We're like 11, 10 or 11 a.m. for me is like a sweet spot. It. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, you, you get to take care of all your, up, everything, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 And especially with a race that's multi a few days in a row, who cares? Really, at the end of the day, yeah. we're... You know, so, exactly. so we started at noon and you guys at the front, at least I'm assuming you're up at the front, just went off like bandits. Like I was like, I was firmly mid pack at that point. Well, so what, what, tell, tell me about that first leg to, to the first aid station at Hidden Valley. So the guy that came into the aid station number, the first aid station, that guy took off like yeah. a bat out of hell. And I'm like, where is he going? Like, why is he running so fast right now? I forget his name, but I, I passed him around mile 25, 26, heading into base camp. Yeah. He, yeah. Walking. Yeah. So like I said, I didn't know really who was in the race, except for I did have one guy on my radar. His name was Wes Rittner, which he's done yeah. all of Canada. He's done the Triple Crown, I think, two or yeah. three times. 
the year before he was second place uh, or 10 hours behind Jeff. I think Kerry Ward paced him. I think that year he was telling me about Wes. Yeah. Yeah. So I knew he would have a fairly good finish. So he was the one guy that I was like, all right, let me just, you know, judge how I'm doing based off of Wes because he's been doing so many of these. He'll, he'll know exactly what, what pace to be doing. So as it goes, I usually just run my own race anyway. So I just went, mm -hmm. went the pace that I felt comfortable with that wasn't pushing too hard. And I need to, um, take back what I said that I, I never run a race with a watch. This is the one race the second, actually this is the third race. I did one back in 2013 or something, 50 K that I wore a watch. And then I wore a watch. Um, I can't remember which one it was, but this was going to be the third race that I was going to wear a watch. Um, and the reason I did it is because I wanted to keep my heart rate at a consistent level for the first, you know, whatever, 50, 100 miles. I, w I wanted to make sure I wasn't getting into, I wanted to stay in fat burning zone, I guess, you know, wait, stay way, way aerobic because, you know, 250 miles is a bit far. So I did wear a watch and that's kind of what I was basing my pace off of. I didn't want to get into the 140 beat per minute range. I wanted to stay in the like 130s, lower 130s, somewhere in the round there. I, I was using it a lot for navigation. Um, I had the route loaded. The Chorus Vertex 2 has like the, the on-screen topo maps. I know you you were using your phone, I think you said more. Yeah. And 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 we'll we can talk more about this, but Moab, it's flagged, but it's not flagged like a, a regular trail race. Eh, yeah. It's sort of a flag every Plus, half half mile to a mile, you know. Yeah. It's, and they uh, also have things that happen. Yeah, I mean, it takes yeah. markings down animals. They say take markings down, which I'll get into that as well. I know there's some watches that have the course on there and they'll vibrate for you if you're yeah. going off course, which I think would be huge and super helpful and would have helped me in two situations for sure. Once we get into it, it still though was, it wasn't perfect because there's sections where there's Okay. you know like say a trail and a road and you're sort of like oh i can't tell which one's which so you oh, have to sure. try one yep. and then you come back a quarter mile and so there's still yeah the the flagging is you have to be prepared for that you got to take your time i i would just say for anybody who's going to run this race probably any of candace's races i'm assuming any of the 200s you're better off spending the two or three minutes to confirm your your route choice rather than just blaze ahead because you're gonna you're gonna waste 10 15 minutes if you have to come back so you're better off taking and, your time when in doubt right and that's why i think the phone is not a bad option because i could zoom in on my Gaia yeah. gps app and i could get like within 10 feet and then yeah. you just go that way a little bit and then you come back and it's like no that's yeah. the way you should have gone but i trusted my own instincts a couple of times which... yeah yeah we'll get to that though i i still want to come back to this tell me about that first because in the film oh, yeah sorry you, you see <laughs> you see you coming into the second aid station a massive back right up ahead with taylor and i'm not sure if you okay. were first or second, but but you were clearly in the front, call it five or so. Yeah. Imagine, so as we headed to legs. the first, as we headed yeah. to the first aid station, my pace dictated that I was going to be, I, I I settled into third place. Okay. Taylor Taylor was up ahead with the guy that took off. He had long hair, yeah. so he yeah. took off. He was easy to spot. Taylor and him were took off together, and then after the first half mile, it kind of worked its way into where we're where where I sat. So I was third place. I could yeah. see them, you know, that first section you, you kind of traverse along the side of the hill once you leave town and you're going over the trail and up and down and I'm looking at my watch and yeah, it, it, it ended up that I was probably 500 feet or so behind, uh, Taylor and the first place guy. So you're kind of and, running your own race at this point. You're yeah. Sort of and Wes, the, yeah. And Wes was like only 50 feet behind me. I could see that out of the corner of my eye, I didn't want to look too much, but I could, I thought it was Wes and it ended up being Wes. But yeah, we came into the first aid station and those two guys came in maybe 30 seconds ahead of me. And I actually left the aid station first. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't really watching them, but all I needed was a little bit of water. I didn't take any food, just water and go. So I left there. Oh, I left there thinking I was in first. What happened was Wes didn't need anything. Maybe he did, but he got out ahead of me, ahead of me far enough where I didn't even know that he was really ahead of me. So I got out second place and I could see Wes up ahead of me 
and they're like, damn, Wes is like going hard. I felt like, but that yeah. must be the pace. So as we're heading to a massive act, then um, I caught Wes. He was doing some navigation stuff, looking for the route. And I'm like, it's over here. So it actually came together with me, Wes, and Taylor all came together before we got to a massive act. So we're going through this yeah. slick rock and going down. And um, I think you got a bunch of video footage in that one. You got a Jeep. Yeah. Jeep yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Andy, yeah I was Sally. running with, uh, I was yo-yoing with Sally and Andy, Sally, yeah. and Andrew Glaze. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, which, if I don't get to it later, I'm a little bit jealous of the fact that you got to run with so many uh, different different groups of people. Um, but we might get into that. So yeah, it was me, Wes, and, and Taylor that came into a massive back pretty much together. I stopped to go to the bathroom, and they got maybe a quarter of a mile ahead of me. Mm-hmm. And by the time we got to the aid station, we came. We pretty much all came in. I would say we came in together. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's 17 and 17 ish miles, the yeah. first crew accessible aid station. And yeah. from there, not that it mattered for you, but from there, it was 50 miles until the next crew accessible okay. aid station. So we I were firmly, realize. yeah, so we were f- firmly back country for those next three or so yeah, aid stations. And at that point, it was getting into like early afternoon already. Mm-hmm. So I think we were all sort of waiting for the sun to set so we could yeah, do yeah. some faster miles, right? I mean, that was kind of cold on that alongside the river right there. Because we were trans- traversing yeah. like with the river, and I was actually really cold in that section, uh, even though the sun was out. It was a little bit shaded, but mm-hmm. um, so yeah, me, Wes, and uh, Taylor all did that whole section, that steep descent, which you got yeah. a bunch of video of that too. Yeah, that was- Jacob's Ladder. Yeah, I had yeah. run that section too from a massive back to basically Jacob's Ladder. I ran that in my training as well, so I kind of knew what to expect. Uh, but that was it. So from from there on, I I didn't know course really until until Shay, and yeah. so that was cool. That was a surprise. That drop down. Yeah, that was really yeah. really neat. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we dropped down into the flatlands, and throughout there, we all pretty much stayed together. Wes, you could see Wes was dropping off just a little bit. Uh, myself and Taylor came into the next aid station together. They had a bunch of different base camp there. Yeah. yeah. Did you see the t- the giant tortoise? I did, and. As I'm trying to get water and get my stuff together, because now I'm like, I wasn't really in race mode, but I was like, yeah, well, I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time at aid stations, right? Well, that's my, that's my MO. I don't want to spend much time at aid stations. I'd like to get in and get out. As I'm trying to fill my stuff up, it, the volunteers were so interested in the fact that there was a turtle right there. They're like, oh, there's a turtle right by your stuff. And I'm like, okay, yeah, big deal. And I'm just filling up my bottles. And then I turn and look. I was like, oh, damn, that's a big turtle. It was like a, the shell must have been two feet around. It was a big turtle. I, I, I looked for it. I couldn't find it. People were like, there's a, tur- there's, a, there's a turtle inside. And I'm looking for it. And I'm like, well, I can't spend. I don't know if it was like, a, was that like a... Uh, I think it was a pet refuge or something. Because yeah, I, yeah. You had on the film there was a skunk there. Was, was that's that well, that skunk must have been wild. I don't know. It was a weird experience, right? Because I came in. Yeah. There's a, I'm petting a dog. They're like, there's a big turtle, and it's all chaotic. And then I see a yeah. skunk, and I mean, the whole thing was a little bit crazy. True, <laughs> the whole, true. It was kind of a weird. Yeah. True. Um, I and there was, you know, that aid station. I think for us, you know, being say in the top ten or so. Um, if, if you were a couple hours later and it was already dark, you'd probably spend more time and you'd sit and eat. They had tons of food there. Like that was a great aid station and the aid stations. I think we should probably point out they're pretty good at Moab. Like they're, yeah. they're, they have really good hot food compared to Europe, especially like where it's just like pasta and that's pretty much it. They had, and I kept it in there. There's a sound bite where a guy's going, Hey Pierce, we got bacon, quesadillas, burgers. Like I kept it in there because he lists like they had like eight hot food options. Like it was pretty amazing. But of course, again, at this point, still pretty early. We're only at 29 miles in. I think I grabbed a quesadilla for the road. Yeah, I didn't even grab anything. I know Taylor yeah. went over there and I think he got some food, but I'm not sure what yeah. it was. Um, but I had I had whatever I wanted on me because I, I typically don't really, typically, <laughs> bad word, because what's coming up in Moab, obviously I ate a lot at the aid stations, but a typical 100 mile or 50K or 50 mile, 100K, I don't really take much from the aid stations. I yeah. usually just have what I want set aside and I usually have a crew. So, but yeah. I knew I knew that I was gonna have to accept stuff from aid stations this race, but I just knew that the first the first 50 to 100 miles, I, I was gonna be set with what I needed. So I was in and out of there pretty quick. So you must've been in second place at this point. 
Taylor right ahead of you because the other guy, like I said, we had just passed him, the guy who had originally been in first. I oh, forget his yeah. name. Yeah, we passed him before we headed into base camp. So you must have been in first or yeah, second. He wasn't you and Taylor. Even in the picture after mile no. seven. I no. don't, he wasn't even with us. So yeah, me and Taylor came into um, base camp together. Wes was maybe 30 seconds behind us, if that. I left there with Taylor. We, we actually this this I, not that we decided, but I said, "Are you ready?" Because I'm ready, and he's like, "Yeah, I'm ready." So we left there together, and that's the last we saw of Wes. Because then we got and went to the water only aid station, Lockhart. Yeah, yeah, which was like four miles later. Yeah, it was. And unfortunately, unfortunately, I I I could have used it ten miles after that, but because <laughs> I ran out of water. I, so I did something there. I okay. drank like a whole. A whole thing of water and then Good. filled up and then refilled so, yeah Smart. And I filled everything um so I, I, I made i made a tactical error there which is thinking oh we're heading into the night i don't need that much water and i think normally that next section which was basically a marathon that next section so from base camp to the oasis forgetting what the water stop is but about a marathon and i think normally it would be during the day for a lot of runners it because was, if they'd yeah, started they later to, no they yeah. started actually i think i think the race used to start at 6 a.m Ah, so okay. They hit, yeah, they hit all those aid stations that we hit in the early afternoon when it was starting to get hot in the day. So that makes you sense. know, six a.m. Yeah. They're at the first aid station by whatever yeah. eight a.m. They're they're starting to get into that hot area where the deserty stuff is by yeah. noon, and it's starting to get super hot for them in all mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. flat areas. And I think that might be why they changed the race start because mm -hmm. the year before they ran out of water at um, one of those. Uh, mm -hmm. a massive back or, or, or Lockhart, one of them ran out mm -hmm. of water. Um, so they had some issues, but, uh, yeah. And that was a lot, like, that was just like a long section. Hey, after it Lockhart was. to the Oasis, like it felt like it just went on and it was winding and up and down and just like never ending. It felt like, so and of course it's me, dark. There's nothing to look at. Like you're just no. looking at your feet. Yeah. I found that really mentally challenging and it was so early in the race. Right. So, uh, fortunately I was running with a guy, Roman, we were sort of yo-yoing a bit, but we were at sometimes talking and at other times just helping to motivate each other to keep moving. Um, but I ran out of water, like a good six miles out from the Oasis. So I was like, really just like, man, like, I can't believe it's whatever it was two in the morning or whatever, you know, midnight or something. And I was so thirsty and okay. I was like, man, I, was I, I, al I already screwed up. Like, I can't believe if I, you know, and it, and it asking. happened a couple times. Like I ran out of water a couple times. So interestingly enough, I've talked to a couple people about the the water, the water situation because yeah. I was really swollen in the race. I don't know if that happened to you or not, but my fingers were swollen, my face was swollen, my legs, and yeah. apparently, you may have not screwed up as much as you thought because um, as the as the temperatures break, apparently your thirst desire is still there but okay. your body it takes your body time to get used to the fact that it doesn't need that water so i didn't run out of water and i don't remember running out of water um but i do remember my hands were swollen already and so you were oversaturated maybe yes and i was yeah. still drinking oh interesting so it, it might have been it might have been saving saving grace for you Who yeah knows? it could have been a blessing in disguise yeah. yeah so then the oasis that now we're at 50 almost 54 miles um i think i grabbed another kiss at the, there real quick um i filled up on water i chugged like a liter of coke because i was so thirsty <laughs> like i just and then i left and i was like i was so bloated but that's that's a good problem to have i think being having a full belly in a race like this so 68 miles then we then the next few miles to sorry it was 14 miles to the island for me again are a bit of a blur I don't know if you. So okay, let, let me just back up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. There's one thing that happened in that section for me, um, that was kind of changing. Is uh, after we left the the Lockhart, Taylor and I were still together, but we were doing, and we had a we had that's probably one of our best conversation moments that we had there. So, um, had a bunch of stories to go through, and I don't even know how many miles we made may have done, maybe ten of it. Together. But you were working together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it ended up being, or it was, it was like he would hike up a hill and I'd be like, well, I don't really think I need to hike this. I was like, should I, at this point, should I just do my own thing or should I stay with him? 
So I let that go for maybe two, two or three miles like that. And then I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to do my own thing. And I slowly started to pull away from him uh, between uh, Lockhart and the Oasis. So that 20, 20 mile section, I, maybe I ran five, five to 10 miles of it with him, but then the next was not with him at all. But my, this is the part that I wanted to get out is my watch, because I never run with a watch, I'm looking at it and I'm like, wait, I was like, why is this thing lit up all the time? Well, my jacket was over it and it was touching it. So it was thinking that I was looking at it the entire time because it lights up when you look at it. Apparently, that's one of the settings. Um, and I was like, well, I need to shut that off. So I'm running, trying to get these things shut off on my phone, on my watch, so that I can let the battery go longer. And I ended up clicking on something and I switched it from miles to kilometers. And that, for you, that's perfect. For me, it messed me up totally. I'm like, wait, I'm at 100. Wait, I'm at a 60. What am I at? 60 kilometers. I'm like, wait, 120 kilometers. What's going on? So I'm trying to fix that the entire yeah. time to the Oasis. So my, my remembrance of that section was me just messing with my watch the entire time and not knowing. I didn't even know where the Oasis was based off of the distance that I was. So it kind of came up on me as a surprise when I got to the aid station. A, a nice surprise because, yeah, I don't really remember, but I know I wasn't yeah, on the water. So. You weren't exactly counting down. I, I, I remember another thing about that section where you could really see headlamps like way, yeah, 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 yeah. right? Like yeah. way, and, and, it, and it was like, are they, so I felt like there were people right behind me on the switchback, yeah, but yeah. they were probably miles away, right? Yeah, but you could see no, their headlamps. Sure. So cool. Yeah. So that's another yeah. thing. Yeah. We were winding in and out and going back yeah. and forth so much. I was like, Wow. There are yeah. a lot of people people either close to me or yeah. Taylor and Wes are like that far behind already. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. man, I got some distance on them already. So I was like, wow, I, was, I guess I'll just keep this up because my pace feels good. You're Yeah, you're in first place then, Oasis. Yeah. It sounds like you didn't stop for very long. Probably no, grabbed a bit of water, but yeah. Water, uh, I don't remember if I changed my shoes there or if I changed them at the next one. Okay, because you had drop eggs at a lot of these aid stations, right? Yeah. Let's yep. see, that one had no drop bag at Oasis. So all I did mm -hmm. was fill up on water. I don't cool. even think I took any food from them because I still had mm -hmm. the stuff on me that I was going to eat. So the next one at the- And, and you know, what, the other thing to point out is that I, so I carried a water filter, um, with my little Solomon XA filter cap just in the back. There were probably two sections on the entire course where you could filter water. And that's like in the mountains, basically, in Shea, Shea Mountain. So- but man, it would have been great if there was a creek. Like the whole time, I'm just like, if oh, if, there's, if only there's a, a puddle, anything, right? But there, <laughs> so it's so funny where you need water, there is no water. Uh, I'd still probably have, you know, it's good to carry one still, because again, there's a couple spots there while well, heading up, heading up Shea Mountain where you can grab some water. But otherwise, it's dry. It's desert. You know. Yeah. What do you, what like do you expect? That, what do you expect? I like that thing on the when you when you when you in the film that you put your pack on. You're like, oh wow. <laughs> That's heavy. That's a full pack. That's pushing the capacity of this 12 liter pack, I'm sure. Yeah, like, like two and I had two and a half heavy. liters. Yeah. 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 And all the be. gear, all the required gear, yeah. like waterproof layers, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, it, it, it really is. I mean, this is just kind of stepping back for a minute. Candace even says, like, this is not a race. This is an adventure. This is an this is an adventure run. And I, I don't know if it came across in the film, but it, you know, these eight to you know, what is it? 14 mile sections, some of them even longer. Like that's a long way between aid stations, yeah. especially at that pace. Like it's hours, three to four hours, hours at a time compared to a 50 K where you're getting an aid station, maybe every six miles, you know, like, so it's a, it's a big difference. Um, it's again, especially at that pace and where you have these weather swings. So you're carrying double the water, double the calories, like all the gear, <laughs> It's a lot like you really when you leave an aid station, you have to think to yourself, like, hold on, do I have everything I need? Because I'm this is it for four hours. Yep. Right. It's a it's yep. a big difference. Yeah. Every I aid station notes. has to count. Yeah. I had to put notes in my drop bag because, you know, obviously you're going to be forgetting stuff. So I mm -hmm. put a note in there, make sure you take this, this, this. So that was definitely something like like you said, there's some like that 20 mile stretch. Let's see. What's my longest time that I had? And this is me race pace. Couple of them were six hour stretches. But like base camp to the oasis, if you don't count the the water only, would have been the longest distance. But there were a couple stretches. I mean, at yeah. the end there, guys are guys are to porcupine, you know, that 20 mile yeah. 
21 miles that late in the race at that night was going, miles? going uphill like that's uh that was a big stretch yeah um okay so you're in first place now um you know oasis indian creek and then for me I've like got indian a little creek spot is where I... indian creek so if you okay because that's that's where well that's where right. first and then I'm like, yeah I'm doing... I, was, I was gonna say for me that was a big milestone i was looking forward to it 68 miles just shy of that i was picking up my first pacer so for me, that was like, I just got to get to Indian Creek. It'll be the middle of the night. I'll have my buddy Kevin there. And as you know, with the pacer, I know you don't often run with the pacer, but it changes everything. It's like a whole new day. You got stories. You got, you know, it just, it's, it's a reset, it was right? It was so, amazing. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll so what, what was that place. like for you heading into Indian Creek? So Indian Creek, I was just, I need, I want to get to my drop bag. That, I, that was all my intent was. I want to get to my drop bag to get the food that I want. I wanted to switch my shoes out. Um, I I took on this set of shoes at a massa back that had a um, a sole in it with with a with a little plate underneath it. I can't remember the name of the company that makes them, but so it puts pressure on your on your uh, plantar instead of so everything spread onto the the toes and heel. So a lot of the pressures on the plantar, and I just remembered I was like, I want to get these things out of here, and I just want to take on a mm -hmm. pair of shoes. So yeah. that was my main goal, but heading toward Indian Creek was, um, I kept looking back because, you know, it was, it was much, it seemed like it was more of a straight, straight jaunt and to the, to the aid station. Maybe I'm not, maybe I'm messed up. I think I was still trying to mess around with my watch too, at that point. So I was still in the watch mode, but when I got to Indian Creek, when I switched everything out, I did eat there. Um, it was a little bit of a, the long, probably the longest stop that I had because I switched my shoes out, wiped my feet off didn't get to do the, the the whole foot wash thing that you did which <laughs> when we were watching that Kira is like that is such a good idea as an aside I got that from Jeff Browning watching him I it was either his Moab or Cocodona film and I know he was having problems with his feet like some rash or something but I was like you know what because I knew from having been there for a couple of weeks like that fine sand just gets in everything like mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to do the same. Let's have a foot bath. Let's wash yeah. off. Let's do a full reset with the feet. So I got that from Jeff. So I can't remember if I had a chance to mention that to him, but I owe, I owe, I owe that to him. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. He's got yeah. a lot of little tweaks that people do. That's why he's such a good coach too. So when I got to Indian Creek, it was weird because there were people there. It was the first time I had seen anybody's crew other than a Mastenback, which was probably yeah. like 10, 10 hours earlier. I don't know how, what the time period was, but it was busy, really, right? Like it was kind of chaotic. It was busy, like, yeah. Yeah. Even for me. And what was <clears> really <throat> funky to me was the this group of four people were like, as I was getting ready to leave, they're like, yeah, Aaron's going to be here soon. And I started thinking to myself, Aaron, what are they? Aaron, who's this Aaron guy? I was like, oh, it must be the long-haired guy. Because at that point, I knew Taylor was, was in second place and Wes was there. So I was like, okay, so this Aaron... I don't, I don't know who this Aaron is, but I think they're wrong. I don't think he's mm -hmm. right there because I hadn't even seen anybody in the last couple hours with the head. And that, and that, of course, is Aaron Kubala, who would go on to finish in third place. And That's correct. I believe it was his first 200 plus mile distance. Yes, he's a younger he guy. So obviously, yeah. like, a you know, he's got some natural talent. But um, yeah, a bit of an unknown, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So at Indian Creek, it was the middle of the night for me. And it was like... Um, it's starting to get cold, so I put put some put some nice clothing on, um, but it's the uh, the next section. Uh, if you had anything else to go along with Indian Creek, go for it. Because well, well, there's one ahead. thing. I I, uh, I if I understood this correctly, um, you dropped your bag of food as you were leaving the aid station. Did I? Apparently, Audrey, my girlfriend Audrey, says she uh, may have saved your race because she saw she saw this guy leaving the aid station and and there was a bag of food on the ground. She's like, "Hold on, hey, do you need this?" And you were like, "Oh yeah, oh, I, yeah, that's I my food." Remember that? Yeah. So apparently, you almost left without your. Maybe you would have noticed and come back, but like, no, I would not have. <laughs> she come back. she she's like, she, I think she gets the assist for absolutely for a, a little bit of crewing for you nice. as well because yeah I yeah i didn't even remember that so, yeah. Yeah, sorry she, she, she wanted me to make sure, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and she said it was the first night i think it was either indian creek or maybe it was shea but i, I think it would have been indian creek yeah yeah it was uh yep. yeah like, but that's the kind of like silly mistake hey like dropping something dropping a headlamp dropping food where that can just screw up your entire race uh-huh for sure yeah. 
So yeah, cool. I'm glad she was there. Yeah. <laughs> I probably ate most of that food on the way to the next aid station. But uh, yeah, the next aid station was just like a, um, or just the, the travel to the next aid station for me, it was actually mm -hmm. a great stint. I had in my mind, I was just like, all right, this is your pace. I got into mm -hmm. a breathing routine, which is what I mm -hmm. tried to do for, throughout the race anyway, which was nose breathing, full nose breathing. I knew if I did that, that I wasn't going to be sucking in a lot of oxygen through the lungs and driving my heart rate up. So I was going to keep mm -hmm. my heart rate low by doing it. I was going to make sure that I maintained uh, a good, good pace because now I'm focused on making sure that I'm breathing real slow. And it's also mm -hmm. from what I've gathered medical podcasts and stuff, it's also a better way to get in oxygen and out oxygen. You're not transferring the carbon dioxide or, so. Well, the nose, the nose acts as a filter as well, which in like dusty conditions could be really good, I'd imagine. And that was a pretty runnable section, right? This is about 13 yeah. miles yeah. to the island. I was with Kevin and I remember it being feeling pretty good. We're moving. Yeah. The sun's kind of coming up. So you're looking forward to that, right? You're like, oh, I just got to get through a couple more hours. Sun's going to come up. Get, get. That's where our that's where our races were just a, were just a bit different. It was still early, early morning. It was still dark. Okay. It was, it was still, still dark. dark. Yeah. Yeah. And I kept See, it's funny. I, I wonder how lamps. far I wonder how far ahead you were from me then. Cause I I I came into the island right as the sun was coming up, as you would have seen in the film. Island, so for you when the sun was coming up, I was there at four forty five. So at least two hours, two and a half hours maybe ahead yeah. of me. Wow. I was supposed to come in there at one forty. But that's yeah no that would have been based on right. that was based on probably improper projections though right yes, like absolutely yeah. but it was a good aid station that's where in the film you saw Hillary and Billy and it was it was you know Andrew Glaze was there again and um, if you weren't that's, careful you could you could spend some time there spent, you could spend some time there I spent a good thirty minutes there for I yeah. eggs that's the first time I actually took a bunch of food from the aid good. station a bunch yeah. of eggs uh, first question how far back you know, the next place person was, and they were like, you know, 40 minutes. So I just took my time there, got everything mm -hmm. together. I was starting to get sleepy too. Uh, so that was the, that was the longest, longest I had stayed at an aid station. Didn't do any sleeping, but you know, had, had a good, good, um, got some calories in. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I left, I left that aid station and two, maybe two or three miles later, I looked back to see, to see if there was any headlamps coming and I couldn't see any. I was like, you know what? I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a five, 10 minute nap, something like that. And I found a nice rock, set my watch for five minutes. I do remember setting it for five minutes, not my watch, my, um, phone. Yeah. Um, and it took me like one minute to fall asleep. And then I was up and awake before the five minute ever went off. Did you wake up cold? Is that why? Like, did you wake no. up? No. no I just, okay. I okay. must have been just antsy or something. I just mm -hmm. I slept for I slept for about three minutes. Yeah. No. Uh, so I like got up. I'm like, well, I just wasted five minutes and I didn't even get any sleep. I was like, I'm just going to keep going. No. So I, I I was going and it's somewhere between there that the light started to come up. And I could see that there was no light coming, but now it's starting to get daytime. So the headlamp, I was like, maybe they don't have their headlamp on, but I did see a headlamp in the distance. So I was like, that must be Taylor. So I, I, I knew I had a pretty good gap on second, not that it was a race at that point. And as I mentioned a lot, I didn't really feel like I went into the, into the Moab 240 as it being a race. Although my competitive nature it always ends up being that way, but I was still considering it just a run. I was like, I don't care if yeah. somebody catches me, but it's still nice to know. So I got into Bridger Jack and it was already daylight. It was like eight, eight o'clock, I think, 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had some food there, but I didn't spend much time. I didn't spend much time at that one. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't, it wasn't that much, that much didn't happen for me in, in that mm -hmm. area. So on the film, you see a little bit, we dropped down into a canyon and it was hot. A river valley is what it was. And, and the navigation was tough too, right? Like you're kind yeah. of running along the river and you're sort of, what, how do we, you know, so not easy. I, I at least had a pacer though. Kevin was helping me navigate, which was great because it was tricky. And there was water and I should have stopped and I should have filtered and I should have drank because then when we started climbing up Shea, it got hot, at least for me, based on the time of day. And 
there was no water. And that was like the first big, like, oh man, like we're heading into the mountains. Like that's when I had my first real low point of the race. So, so how was that for you? So my Bridger Jack was as soon as we, before I got down into that river that you were talking about, I actually went off course. And I think it's because I was so tired and, and just, I was, I was starting to get into the mode where I was like a little bit of zombie. Like I, yeah. I, I left there, left that aid station and we hit that, that gravel road and I ran mm -hmm. right past the drop. There was, there was a sign. Yep. Yeah. There was a sign right there yeah. that said, you know, right turn. A yeah. bunch of flagging. I was on the left side of the road. I never even saw the sign. I ran past it, and I'm there's a car coming at me. I was like, "Oh, there's traffic on this road." Whoa! And I went went ran down a little bit and around a corner and got to another point. And I'm like, "I haven't seen any ribbons." I was like, "Just yeah. for the hell of it, I'm gonna check my phone." And I looked at my phone, and I wasn't even close to being on course. I ran a half mile before I ever looked at my phone. Well, it's a good thing you did because the, what I sometimes do is go, "Well, I'll just go another half mile." Or a mile yeah. until I until I hit a ribbon. So it's a good thing you stopped and took took the minute. Yeah, I was like, no, I'm gonna check this. And I looked and I looked back. I was like, ah, it was so deflating. I'm super tired. I'm like, I just mm -hmm. ran a half. I didn't know how far it was, but it ended up yeah. being a half mile. Yeah. So I'm running back, and now I'm trying to kick ass to try to get back to it because right, I just right. lost all this time. Yeah, it was tough. And even even with Kevin, there was a couple times where you know stopping and looking and yeah, like it just it wasn't just like a trail we were oh, crossing goodness. rivers we were climbing you know climbing up going around stuff like it was it was a convoluted the train the train is just yeah. you know it's not you there's know, no trail there and the and the way the mind works is i was in a river i was on a river bank like so i'm just going to follow this that's follow the river yeah. where the race yeah. where, where the race goes and i did yeah. but good thing you have to make sure that you're not focused on just follow the river bank because it kept going and we yeah. actually went off off the trail at some point yeah. so and that's where right where one of the spots were where there was no there was no marking up um but i was on my phone a lot during that section yeah. and that's right where the eclipse happened for me is before i started doing okay. the climb up to sh up the first the first real climbing of the race that started and it kind of messed with me because here it is middle of the day you know it seems like it's super late afternoon but I didn't yeah. have, I didn't bring my glasses with me. So oh, you didn't have your little, because those, ecl those eclipse glasses, I didn't really mention this in the film, but the, the race gave those to us. Yeah. The, yeah. And then we bought some extra ones for our crew and pacers as well. So those were, they were selling them in Moab, but yeah. And I was like, what's going on? It's like late afternoon. I was like, and yeah. then it hit me. I'm like, oh, it's the eclipse. That's what's yeah. going on. Uh, but my mind soon forgot that. So when I'm doing the climb up to Shea and that was freaking stupid deep it was so hard it was so hard I didn't yeah have poles i didn't really oh. realize that i needed poles and yeah that was probably like there's a trail by us it's called uh the bear it's 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 um uh, bear canyon trail and mm -hmm. i did a lot of my training on it mm -hmm. but um it was st as steep as that like i couldn't and it was loose it was. like it was it was yeah. loose it was steep and i again i had run out of water again like i just felt so silly i kept running out of water but it's like how much water are you going to carry you know like yeah. more than a couple like i'm just not used to carrying more than a couple liters so i should have had an extra like half liter to a liter though for that section but really what it was is we crossed a creek just before that and i didn't bother filling up because i'm thinking oh creek. there's water it's probably running off the mountain and i had this feeling like we're going to be climbing along a creek the whole time well we, we never saw it again so I didn't really realize that that section was, that was like a crux of the race for me because that yeah. was like steep stuff and I was still pushing to get up it. And I tried to sleep on that, on those climbs up and around there. And I would lay yeah. down, like get a spot that was all nice, lay down. And in my mind, I'm like, but Taylor's going to be coming through any minute now and he's going to wake me up. So what good is it going to do to sleep? So there was two times that I tried to lay down and I, I laid there for like 30 seconds going, nope, I'm not doing, th I'm not doing this. And then I got to the why, top. Why did you choose to lay down there, Jesse? Like, were you just so tired that you were like, tired. I, I, I just tired. have to, yeah. yeah. For anybody who race. hasn't been there, like even, I mean, you mentioned that three minute nap felt like a waste, but sometimes even just a few minutes, like it, it just, just closing your eyes. So you don't have to like, just so focus, good. just feel so good. Just, yeah. just giving your mind a break. It's not about your body. It's really your mind, right? For a couple of minutes. I actually, especially later on in the race, got into this thing where I'd start just like leaning over my poles and just closing my eyes for like five seconds. 
and it felt so good. And then I'd open my eyes and be like, okay, I can keep going because you just need to give your mind like just a second. And in fact, sometimes I do this quite often when I'm running on like a dirt road, like late in the middle of the night, I'll just like run with my eyes closed for a few seconds at a time. Hmm. Cause it gives, gives me, gives me a chance just to rest. If I know, if I know I'm not going to trip, you know, hmm. Anyway, for me, anyway, that's like sometimes those micro naps, it's not the same as a quality 45 minute nap, yeah. but they can just like, you're just, you're, you're fighting. Like your body's like, I need to sleep. Yeah. And you're like, no. And you're, it's this battle with your, you know. I think anyway. I remember, remember you saying that you started to hallucinate during. I was hallucinating heading into Shay. I don't, it's, I don't usually get problems to like night two but it was just like sort of you know my eyes were playing tricks on me it wasn't yeah. like I was seeing things at that point um later on I was seeing things for sure but yeah I and I don't know if that was like partly I mean I was dehydrated heading up into Shea um and maybe it was like a bit of the heat like I don't think it was just the sleep deprivation for me I think it was a little bit of just general fatigue yeah, I think the heat had, yeah. had a bunch to do with that. And for me, yeah. that that section, because I was still on the loose stuff, climbing up to get up. up I don't know the, the, the peaks or the mountains, like what we did, but I know we yeah. went up to a yeah. high point. And then, and then dropped a bit. going down. Yeah, on a road and it was bright, at that point, yeah. right? At, yeah. the, at that high point, I was like, that's it. I said, I'm going to sleep here. I'm going to sleep for maybe 10 minutes. And I got all positioned and nice and all comfortable. And then I could hear in the distance somebody going, hey, hey. Like they were like doing either a cattle drive. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or... That was a cattle drive for sure. So yeah. I was like, oh. I was like, okay, well, hey, hey, every 30 seconds is going to keep waking me up. So I'm like, I'm not going to sleep here. So I got back up and started to do the descent down, hit the road. And I was like trying to look at my phone to see how far I had to get to the next aid station because my watch died. My watch finally died at that section right when we started climbing up uh, out of the river valley. Up those, okay. the, those climbs kind of rolling, but it's steep. Yeah, also. yeah. And my watch died there, so I no longer had distances on my watch. Oh, by the way, I fixed at one of the aid stations. I think it was the Indian Creek one or Island. I fixed my watch to get back, back into miles. To, to miles. Good. So I was able to figure <laughs> that out. Um, but then my watch died, so I didn't have that. So as I'm on the, on the road that climbs up to Shea, the proper climb up to Shea, it's a, it's a dirt road yeah. that kind of winds back and forth. I keep looking back because at this point I'm like, I wasted so much time trying to sleep three times and Taylor's gotta be on me by now. And he wasn't, and I got into Shea, but that's climbing, starting to climb up towards Shea is when I started to feel like my lungs. I could feel I was starting to get phlegm in my throat, a feeling mm -hmm. that I had previous at Hard Rock, like mm -hmm. whatever it was two months before, which shut me down. So pulmonary edema type, yeah. type reaction where, where the phlegm starts and then your body starts to react to the dusty conditions and the heat mm -hmm. and it starts to produce phlegm which then gets into your lungs and then you start packing up this yellowish type of material and it started for me heading up to Shea so when I got into Shea I Candace was there and it, I think this might even be on the on the feed that they had the live feed where I told her I was like ah, I was like I'm starting to get pulmonary edema and uh I mentioned that to her and I finally was decided like, I'm going to sleep here. I'm going to, I'm going to get some food. I, I, I had, I had on my foot. I thought I had a big, a big old blister that I had started on, on one of my toes. I was like, I'm going to get this taken care of. I'm going to mm -hmm. eat. I'm going to sleep. It's Shay. I'm like, but I'm so far behind in my time. Cause what happened was with the, with the eclipse, my mind went to it's late afternoon. I thought I was there at like 4 PM. I was like, I'm so far behind my, you know, my predicted time i was like i was supposed to be here at two something and it's like and they're like well it's two and i i looked at my my sheet that i had with me i had this all folded up i was like wait a minute two i was supposed to be here at 250 i was supposed to be here at 215 and it's actually 226 i was like i'm only five minutes off of my predicted time i'm like i'm doing great so I went and got my foot worked on. I told the guy, okay, put me down for 10 minutes of sleep. I said, can you wake me up in 10 minutes? So 
he was working on my foot and that's actually in your film. He was working on my foot yeah. and, and, uh, I, I took, I may have slept 10 minutes. I'm not sure. I'm saying, I'm saying I slept 10 minutes cause that's what I asked him to do and had my foot worked on. In the meantime, Taylor came in right when I was getting myself set to get ready to go. So that, that and that yeah. showed up in the film. So you slept at Shea. About I didn't. Minutes. So I, I still hadn't slept at all. I had, hadn't had any trail, any dirt naps. I didn't sleep at Shea. I kept going. So while I was having some maybe hallucinations earlier, um, it seems like maybe, yeah, you were you were having to sleep a bit more early on, but you had the time. Well, I mean, you were way was, ahead. So. My plan was to try to sleep before I climbed Shea. That's what Jeff Jeff Browning and I had a discussion. He's like, "Yeah, you want to get some sleep in so that you're fresh." Tell, tell me about that. Tell me about that. So was that a time based thing? Was he like, "Because you'll be twenty out twenty four hours yeah. in"? And it was time based slash what the terrain is going to be like, setting yourself up for success for the next for the climb. tough stretch. Yeah. yeah, let's get let's get some sleep, and you yeah. then you'll make that climb happen. That's smart. It'll, That's it'll smart. Perfect. Yeah. Well, there's a thing in these races where you you can dig yourself into a hole if you go too long. And then you're just you're just moving so slowly that you're just wasting time. So sometimes getting ahead of that and having a nap, like you said, to prepare for the next section is a really smart thing. Don't wait until it's like too late and you have to sleep in the dirt. Yeah. So my plan was to try to sleep before I started the climb up to Shea. Leaving. Were you planning like, though to have that nap at Bridger Jack? No, I didn't. You not always plan to sleep on the station. trail. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was going to sleep somewhere on the trail, but without knowing the trail, I didn't know what the terrain looked like. So I was like, and we were going through that little river bottom and it was so hot and dusty that now it's, now it's middle of the day. I was, yeah. you know, it was a bad time to try to sleep because it's daylight and it's hot out and, um, I didn't, it, it just didn't work. And from there we had to climb, we were climbing up and around the back of Shea Mountain. So there yeah, was the like, new portion. You were, yeah, the new portion. Yeah. This is now the new portion that nobody had climbed. And it was 12 Green. miles. It was basically a loop to go up and around and then back down to Monticello Lake, which was yes. really just down the road from Shea yeah. Mountain Aid Station. But we had to kind of go around the back side of the mountain. Exactly. Yeah. It was a beautiful climb. I had so much so nice. experience through that. I tried to sleep yeah. again. Even though I took a 10 minute nap, I tried to sleep one more time. But I was like, but Taylor's behind me again. So right. it didn't work. So I yeah. wasted a lot of time trying to sleep or thinking about sleeping and just it just was a bad i didn't have a i didn't have a great plan as yeah. you did you had you had really you really had good plans so um yeah my climb up to shea the pulmonary pulmonary edema really started to, to work in and it just it was like every time i tried to push to go up the climb my heart rate was elevated my breathing was mm -hmm. restricted um my so my heart rate being elevated was the one thing that i was like I've had that happen before at UTMB. It happened for me where I, I had my heart rate was elevated due to probably too much caffeine. And I got to the aid station and slept for a little, like 10 minutes and woke back up and my heart rate's still at 90. I'm like, wait, why is my heart rate at 90 when I'm like, just took a 10 minute nap and I haven't been running yeah. for the last half hour. Yeah. And I actually had to pull myself out. I pulled myself out of the race uh, at UTMB because of it. So I had, I have had this in my mind before where I'm like, I'm not, I'm not out here. I'm out here to enjoy this. I'm not out here to yeah. die. So as I'm climbing up Shea, it's getting er, around Shea, whatever that climb name of that climb was, I'm thinking to myself, I'm not out here to kill myself. And that's when I started thinking it's getting, you know, to that time of day, I was like, I wonder how Kira, how Kira did, you know, in her race. Cause she was doing a hundred miler during that time. So I was like, I don't want to die out here. I wonder how she's doing. Uh, so I actually turned my phone on because I was like, maybe get a text message or something. So, Cause I had an airplane mode to keep the battery. Um, and it was, it was on the descent down to Monticello Lake where I was like, even the descent was tough for me to do. Like mm. even trying to run down the descent was like I'm breathing so hard. I was like, this mm. is not good. Something's wrong. I was like thinking to myself, well, I have service here. I texted her and I was like, how'd you do? And she's like, she didn't like respond with anything that was, you know, I did great or I dropped or anything like that, but at least I had service. And I was like, you know what? I have service right now. My pacer was scheduled to, to be at dry Valley, which was the next aid station. Yeah. I was like, why doesn't he should come here? Let me see if he can come here to crew me. Well, as I opened up my messages, he put in a text. He's like all set. 
dropped Jeff dropped me. Jeff dropped the car at um, Road Forty Six. No, okay. Geyser Pass. He dropped oh, okay. the car at Geyser Pass because before all this race started, there was the logistics involved with trying to get my pacer yeah. to the right spot where yeah. he was going to be, how he was going to get there because he didn't yeah. have a way to get the car after we finished. So there was a big logistics thing. It's it's a whole thing. And if I can just, like you and I talked about this before, like yeah. when we did connect, it, pacers are great, but they add a whole other dimension of planning i mean as the runner this is now okay you know and you're a little bit stressed all the time like is my pacer going to be there are the, you're thinking about your pacers you're thinking about your crew as a runner you do feel a responsibility and of course it's your plan you're the one who briefs them and tells them where to right. be and what time to That's be and right. if that screws up at all you're you're the one going hmm, i wonder if they know this and so yeah. sometimes keeping it simple and just going out and banging these things out on your own Sometimes See, it's yeah. less stressful, right? I had my list. I had the times I was going to be yeah. at the aid station. Now he's going to be wondering, where are you? Because I felt like I'm falling way behind. Like I'm two hours behind. Like, so I saw the text from him that he dropped. Because before the race started, I was like, all right, here's the plan, Kevin. You're going to drive your car to Dry Valley mm -hmm. to, to crew me. And then you're going to drive to Geyser or to Road 46 drop your car or get somebody to drop your car at Geyser Pass because you're going to start pacing from Road 46. So I was going to have him drop his car at Geyser mm -hmm. Pass, get a ride down to 46, and then he could run back up to his car and be done. Um, so that's what we talked about before the race started, but I didn't have any communication with him during the race. So he wasn't even mm -hmm. going to get in. He, he wasn't flying in until Saturday. He got yeah. there at like noon or something like that. So he was pretty much on his own to figure out what he was going to do once he got to Moab. He rented a car and it was a big it was a big unknown combobulation of what he was going to do and where we were going to meet. One more note on the pacer thing just to add to this in Moab. Maybe this is the case in a lot of races, but in Moab the Moab 240 you cannot drop your pacer at any That's aid right. station that isn't a crew accessible aid station. And those That's aren't, right. you know, those are only every 20 or 30 miles. So you have to decide if I'm taking this pacer on, That's can right. they keep up? What if they have a problem? You'd have to wait with them until you can get to That's another right. aid station. And that's another reason why I was like, you know, he wanted to do more than 30 miles, but I was like, let's just get you, let's get you from what I heard, uh, Michele Gagalia is a friend of mine. He ran the race in Moab, and he won it. Jeff ran the race. He won it. He said, and Michele both said, you want to have a pacer for the section, Pole Canyon, up to Geyser. Yeah. Because that's like a lot of navigational issues. It's late in the race. You're tired. So I was like, yes, I'll take you on as a pacer, Kevin. This is a section I want you to do. He's like, oh, I can do from Dry Valley to all the way there. I was like, no. I, I was like, then you're tired. That would be uh, 50, 56 you. miles to yeah. be with you. At. Yeah, that's a lot. Like, no, I don't want you to do that. So um, I, I appreciated his exuberance, but at the same time, I was needed to, you know, needed to look out for myself. So the reason that all came up is because when I had tech service, I said, I'm running a bit behind. I wanted to say, meet me at Monticello Lake. That way he mm. could, you know, assess whether or not I needed to assess whether or not I was going to drop out of the race because of the whole heart rate. I was like, probably heart rate, can't breathe yeah. type thing, energy super low. Mm -hmm. uh, but that text never, I don't know that the text made it through because I think I stopped because I saw his text that said, all set. I'm at Geyser. Right. Cars at Geyser Pass, and I'm sitting at Road 46 waiting for you. Um, so I got down into Monticello, and it was it was a it was a grind to try to even run downhill. And I got to Monticello Lake, and so when I dropped, I, I was with Taysom then at that point, my second pacer. We dropped down to Monticello Lake, and that's where I had my first nap, uh, which is what we had we had kind of planned. That was the that was the whole plan. It was like 60 to 90 minutes, like a good solid nap at about the 34 hour mark. And I think I arrived around 33 hours. Um, so that was kind of right on the schedule for me. Based on the previous couple of 200s I've done, I remember the first time I tried to sleep after like 24 hours, 26 hours, and I was just too wired. Like it was a waste of time. It was like you said, you lie down, you're stressed. And then another time I tried to go too long, I think like 40 hours. And 
I d- had dug myself into a hole. And so I, I, for me, that 33, 34 hour mark just feels like the sweet spot. Everybody's a little bit different, but uh, so that was kind of my plan. So I laid down for an hour. That also gave Tace and my pacer a chance to have a break because he had run now 12 miles, uh, whatever that would be. Yeah, 12 miles. And his plan was to keep going with me for another, oof, what is it? 16 miles to Dry Valley. And so I was a little bit worried about making him run that far, but the fact that he could also have a nap and eat and recharge felt pretty good. And that was also where we, our plan again was like to reassess. So when he offered to pace, I was like, cool, let's start with that 12 miles and see how we do. There and I want to get a feel for, for how, cause I had actually never met him in person. I'd never run with him before, but I, I could see he was strong. He was looking good, much better than I was at that point, 140, <laughs> you know, 126 miles into the race. So, but, but that's a little insight for people where as a runner, again, especially if your goal is podium, you know, you want to pick your pacers wisely and have a plan for what happens if my pacer ends up having a bad day. What if they yeah. roll an ankle? How how do we get how do we help them and get them yeah, out of the absolutely. race without without sacrificing your results? So yeah. something that's something to keep in mind. Yeah, for sure. I have to say that watching the film, it didn't it didn't look like you were struggling at all up to that point. For sure. It looked like you had a nice smooth pace going on. I, I think Taysen was a little surprised at how slowly I was moving. And I was like, no, no, this this is this is what two hundred milers look like. You know, this is, this is it. Like, yeah, you know, this sure. is, this isn't slow. This is just 200 mile pace. And so I think he might've been expecting like, you know, that he, cause he was a little bit, he was a little bit worried. And then I think a few miles in, he's like, oh yeah, this is no problem. I yeah. could, I can handle this pace for 30 miles. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, so we slept and then we got out of there. Um, but it was firmly like firmly night, uh, night two at that point for me. So it you was pretty early. Me, yeah, so. you would have been hours earlier, so you would have been I was dinner, dinner time. To be there, I was supposed to be there at five. So I'm guessing. Did you sleep at Monticello Lake again? Yes. Yeah, Monticello Lake. I had a whole plan. My plan was to drop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold on. Clarify plan. your plan coming off of Shea was now to drop. You were thinking this coming is down to Monticello. Yeah. Yes. Coming down to Monticello. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I said I need I need to drop out of this race. I was like I'm yeah. not dying out here, so I had a whole plan. I was like, all right, what I'm gonna do? And this this kind of came together at Monticello as I was sitting there, because I knew I knew I kind of wanted Kevin, my pacer, to be at Monticello just so that you know I could. I actually wanted him to be there so that he could get me anything that I might have needed. Uh, a little bit of encouragement to get me to Dry yeah. Valley. Um, he could see me earlier because he was he was he was very interested in wanting to like help out, not to pace you to the next section. He just wanted no. him there as support. Yeah. yeah, yeah, just as support. Maybe I needed a little more protein, whatever. Yeah, and and possibly as I'm coming down Shay, thinking, well, if he's here, I could assess, and maybe I need to drop. Yeah. So he never made it there. I'm at Monticello. They're asking me questions. I'm kind of like, like my head is foggy because I'm a lack of oxygen for such, you know, for so long. Uh, I ate some food there and then I told them that I wanted to sleep for 20 minutes. I was like, Can, let me sleep for 20 minutes. They had a, I don't think that was a sleep station. What was it? I didn't mention this in the film, but while you're looking that up um, for the audience, there were sleep stations that obviously I didn't need because we had the vehicle and we simply, I just said, if I'm going to sleep, I'll sleep in the vehicle. Why mess yeah. around? It's warm. I had my stuff there. It's quiet. We could park down the road, but there were sleep stations as there usually are at these big 200 mile races. Even in Europe, yeah. they have sleep stations where they have cots and things. So did you use the sleep stations? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so they had, that's why I was about to bring up the sleep stations. Like you said, usually have cots and blankets and, maybe a tent and something to keep you warm. Somebody um, to wake you up, right? Like, wake you up. Yeah. So I had with me only the gear that I had with me. That aid station was great because they had blankets. They had a cot. I was like, oh, you guys have all that? But there was a fire going and I went, I was like, I'll use it. I was like, put me to, you know, see if you can wake me up in 20 minutes. I was like, I need, I need a nap because I said, I don't really feel like continuing this, the race as as is under the conditions that I am. Let me sleep this off. Maybe... Maybe my lungs will come back. Something will happen. So I, I put it down for 20 minutes. Well, in that 20 minutes, Taylor 
now arrives. So I hear stuff going on. Taylor's there. So as I'm laying there, I'm like, wait, Taylor's here? That means he's here. That means his crew is here because I could hear them talking. I was like, you know what I could do is because I need to get to Dry Valley, what I'll do is I'll set it up so that I'll run to Dry Valley to, just to see if this whole situation I got going on straightens itself out. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, I'll have Taylor's crew, who's going to be at Dry Valley, pick me or take me to Kevin, who's waiting at Road 46. We'll pick Kevin up. We'll go back to the finish line, grab my car, drive up to uh, Geyser Pass, where his car is, get his car, and then we can go back yeah. to my place and sleep. That was my plan. Yeah. So I left Monticello with that plan in mind. I told his crew, don't leave, don't leave Dry Valley without me. And they're like, oh, well, the guy that's going to Dry Valley already left to go to Dry Valley because they had two, two vehicles. It was Taylor had his mom there, his sister, his uh, sister's son. He had a big, a big, a big crew um, hmm. helping him and two different cars. So, um, so they had, they had a bunch of people, but you know, they didn't have the same people in the same car. So they said that the person already left to go to dry Valley. And at that point in time, Taylor now was, came in in second place. He left there in first place. I was like, oh, how long ago did Taylor leave? They're like, oh, two minutes ago, two to three minutes. I was like, oh, okay, cool. So I left there thinking I might catch him. So I'm chasing Taylor, not really chasing him, but I'm, ch I'm chasing Taylor's headlamp. I was like, at some point, I'm going to see Taylor's headlamp. About a mile and a half to two miles out of the aid station, uh, this is another one of the critical points, I was like, I passed I saw, I saw a marker for a trail, but the road continued, and I ran right past this marker. I was like, huh, that's funny. I was like, there was a marker back there. I was like, I, but there was no flagging on it, so that wasn't the way to go. I'm just going to stay on this road. And I ran for maybe another maybe two minutes. I was like, you know what? I don't see any markings here. I'm just going to pull my phone out just to make sure. Pulled my phone out, and yep, I'm off course. I'm like, how did this happen? I was like, why didn't you just look when you were at that marker? And I ran back following the course to the spot, spot where, where, where I was supposed to go. And sure enough, that marker that didn't have a flag on it, it was just a trail marker, was the spot that you were supposed to get off, go, go onto the trail. We, we had, we had some trouble on that section too. I, fortunately I was with Tayson, you know, so this is heading from Monticello Lake to dry Valley. We're dropping down mostly in, back into the desert. It's uh, I think it was a 14 mile stretch. 16 miles. And um, I remember at least once when we came into like a clearing and it was like, we didn't know which there was like a few options. We didn't know how to leave the clearing. We we're, you know, poking around. I remember going into a forest at one point, we just lost the trail and we had to fan out. He and I were like bushwhacking, like looking for, you know, looking at our phones, like. And granted, I mean, they had to put those markings out long in advance. So yeah. you don't know what happens, but it also seemed like that stretch was probably probably the least marked for me it's that frustration where it's yeah. like are we doing the barkley marathons or are we doing a, tra a marked trail race <laughs> yeah. because mentally you're like one foot in front of the other and you're thinking about hydration nutrition yeah but then you're like oh i've got to pull up my i got to mess around with yeah. na navigation so i think again that's for anybody going into a race like this mentally going like there are going to be times just be prepared don't get frustrated where you're gonna have to pull out your phone it's yeah. part of, you know, unfortunately, or, or, you know, we're all, everybody's in the same boat. Everybody had the same experience. Yeah. It's part of the game in this race. Uh, I, I needed to back up back to Monticello at Monticello. Yeah. I was like, I'm dropping at dry Valley. So you guess what I did? I got my watch, took my watch off. Cause I took my watch off at Shea and threw it in my drop bag. Cause I didn't need it anymore. It was dead. I took ah. my, my reserve power, whatever your power, yeah. your power bank. I took and put yeah. the power bank. I, I dropped that at Monticello Lake too because I was like, I'm, I'm not going to need it anymore. It's just extra weight. Um, so I got rid of my power bank. Um, so yeah, I'm on Monticello. I'm 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 from Monticello Lake down to Dry Valley, and you're right, it's up and down. And I was having so much trouble. I couldn't do. I couldn't run downhill. I couldn't run uphill. I couldn't run flats. Obviously, you can't run uphill if you can't run downhill. 
but the flats were messing with me. It was like all this phlegm was coming up from mm -hmm. the previous previous stint. And I'm like, yeah, I said, I need to get to Dry Valley before Taylor's crew leaves. And Taylor yeah. left this aid station before me, and I still haven't caught him. I'm probably five to 10 miles in. It's funny how focused you were on that because there were going to be dozens of crews you could have got a ride with. You know what I mean? Like I never even thought about that. Like there's so many every runner behind him. You just I didn't had even to, think about you that. You just would have had to lay down for two hours and wait for them. <laughs> you could have had a nice nap That's and got a ride with first. my crew. I mean, it's so funny that you were in the moment that but the other thing, I just want to point this out. So as much as you said, you know, you kind of went into this running your own race, but you can get competitive. Clearly, for the last Eight, 10 hours or whatever you had been competitive you're yeah. you're changing your race strategy for better or for worse like I, I should have a nap but taylor just came in i gotta leave you know so you at that point you already weren't running your race mm -hmm. and the other thing to point out this is more for the benefit of anybody listening watching this at home the way you ran this race which is what led to you winning it to be clear is not the way most people sh need to or sh should run a 200 miler because you could have said I'm having some breathing issues. I'm going to lay down and sleep for 10 hours. And you could, you would like, you had days of buffer at the end of That's this race. True. You could have said, I'm going to change my strategy and sleep for two hours at every aid station and just take my time and enjoy myself before this long issue gets any worse. But instead you're thinking either I'm going to do my best or I'm going to drop. There's no in between. And that's fair. I mean, I think I think runners who are used to performing at your level, that's your it, that's your instinct. It's like why dig yourself into a hole out here if you're having a bad day. But for most runners, I think especially if it's your first 200, you've got to come into a race like this being willing to adapt and just say, "Hey, if I'm the last runner, so be it. I'm going to get this huge. thing done." And just go slower, just take breaks, just sleep, just enjoy it. Just basically throw your plan out the window. Cause it, again, you could have like, you, you could have slept, right. you could have slept for six a hours a day. And, and at this point you were so far ahead of everybody. You could have slept for six hours and let me cat, cat, catch up to you. And you would have still been, you know, top five. So just to point that out, this is, it, it's not, you know, you were racing on a razor's edge. And so when, when you sort of fell off that edge, it felt like the only logical conclusion was to drop, yeah. but that's not how your average mid to back of packer is going, it is going to approach this race. So you're right. So right about that. And I never even thought about it that way. I'm glad you brought that up. I think my, my aspect was, I was just, I didn't think I could recover from this, this lung issue, this, this phlegm, this like heart rates accelerated type thing i thought, felt like i was really really in danger of like possible you know not i i don't think i would have ran hard enough to die but it it went through my mind because you're like mentally you're 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 stripped mentally you're tired there's all kinds of things going on so yeah that the the trip down to dry valley from monticello was a pretty bad section for me mentally because i was i was like i retired from ultra running in that section like there's no reason to be out here doing this any longer no. like um couldn't run uphill couldn't run downhill i was like all over the place like with you know wanting to just end it but at the same time i'm thinking i need to get to monticello before taylor's crew gets leaves uh and or not monticello but dry valley yeah so I worked at the Dry Valley Aid Station the year before, mm -hmm. and I remember seeing from the aid station, you can see headlamps a good 10 miles away or, or eight miles away. So I was looking for the Dry Valley Aid Station as I'm running from the other direction, running it toward yeah. the Dry Valley. I'm trying to dis, you know see where it is, how far away I am, I'm trying to still find Taylor's headlamp. I saw a headlamp or a light way in the distance, maybe two miles away. And then at one point I saw a headlamp behind me or two headlamps behind me. Like as you're meandering through, I didn't know how far away they were. I was like, oh, third place is, third place is right there. He's going to catch me soon. And I got uh, just a couple miles. I, I remember coming around a corner, which is maybe three miles. That's, that's where you can see. From the yeah. aid station, you can see about three miles out, the headlamps coming around. Uh, and I got to that spot and I saw the, finally saw the 
the aid station and I thought I saw a headlamp way up in the distance. And I was like, oh man, Taylor's at least two miles ahead of me. He could be in and out of that aid station and his crew could leave before I get there. So I busted ass for the last two miles, like ran as hard as I could to get to the aid station before. That's Taylor so funny. You're left. racing, racing so you can drop, drop and get a, and get a ride. So yeah. I could You're like, I can't let yeah. that crew leave. I need a ride back to my car. That's the funniest. <laughs> it's <sighs> it, it's it, that last mile to the aid station, or minus the blacktop road that takes you to into the aid station, is super sandy. Like there's a there's a section yeah. there that was like maybe a quarter of a mile long that's all sand. And I remember just like just giving it, getting trying to get through that so I could get to the road so I could get there. And I get there, and I also had to go to the bathroom. They have a port of portage on there. I went to the bathroom. I come out of it and I go up to the aid station. I was like, oh. I was like, where's Taylor? Is Taylor still here? They're like, Taylor. I was like, they're like, you're the first person here. I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, oh, you guys aren't going to believe this. And I sat down on the rock. There's a big flat rock there. And I said, I know you guys are going to think I'm crazy. But, you know, because I'm in the lead, but I need to drop. And they're like, wait, what? You're not going to drop. Just eat some food and take a nap. And I can't remember her name. I think she's run, run or won the race before. But she, somebody told me that she was the one at that aid station. And that aid station takes, took such good care of me. And I got, I was all upset with the fact that Taylor was not at the aid station yet. I was like, I was like, Taylor went off course right where I went off course. And I was like, I felt so bad for him. I was like, I can't believe Taylor's out there somewhere. Like he went off course and, oh man, I can't believe that he's not here. And, but I laid down for my nap and like I said, okay, I'm going to sleep for a half hour. She got me a burger. I slept and like five minutes before I was about to get up, he pops his head and he's like, hey, were you looking for me? I was like, yeah, where were you? He's like, I don't know. I was behind you, I guess. And and uh, so he ended up leaving there 10 minutes before me. Men ended up leaving um, Dry Valley. And I didn't get the story of what happened to him. Like, I know. Well, okay. Oh, well, where, At this where? point, I know. Because I've where? run with Taylor since. Okay. Because he lives like 45 minutes from me. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, so we broke down the whole race on the run that we did. So it was pretty fun. But he ended up not leaving Monticello Lake before me because he oh. was running the wrong direction out of the aid station. <laughs> and it, it took him to, there was a set of toilets there. And he's like, well, seeing as how we're out of the way, because it was only like a couple hundred feet. But he's like, oh, there's toilets here. Let me just use the, use the restroom. Sure. Yeah. So I was chasing a ghost the entire ah. time from Monticello to Dry Valley. Taylor was never ahead of me. At this point, like none of that really matters, but no. it's so easy to work yourself up and oh, you're yeah. doing math and you're making decisions. Like even I had been doing that a little bit, even though I wasn't really in race mode yet before this, but you know, a little bit of like, oh, somebody just came in. I better get out yeah, of here. It's there. And it doesn't, and it doesn't matter. But, no. but in the moment you feel like I need to get ahead of fifth place and keep staying four, like, or whatever yeah. you, you, you convince Hold yourself. Your position. Hold your position Hold and your position or yeah. And it. yeah. And sometimes that's good. Sometimes that keeps you moving, but sometimes it makes you kind of make tactical mistakes, rush, you know, not, not take care of yourself. I mean, so. I could have dropped if, if things would have worked out perfectly, I wouldn't have even finished my lab. <laughs> that's so funny. That's so funny. So, okay. So dry Valley, I came in again, I, I was still a few hours behind you at this point. Maybe I was gaining some ground, but probably not because I slept in Monticello Lake for 45 minutes and then I came to the dry valley and I, I had to sleep again. I was like, you know what? I'm going to sleep another hour. But that time it was because I knew that at that point I was going to be on my own for the next, you know, 27 miles heading into road 46 without a pacer. So that was a little bit of me preemptively going like, I want to set myself up for success here. Did you sleep at dry valley? I did 30 minutes. Okay. So instead of dropping the, 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 the volunteers there, they're all, they're all great. And most, mm -hmm. almost all the volunteers have done stuff like this before. So they know. They said, Jesse, lie down, don't drop, take, take a break, eat some food, see how you feel. And the person that was taking care of me, she was, she was very calm. She was like, do you need anything else? After I woke up, do you need anything else? Your 30 minutes is up. And I was like, yeah, maybe I'll eat something else. I was like, um, 
She's like, unfortunately, Taylor's crew is gone, so you don't have a ride back. I was like, oh, okay. I was like, all right, so I, I'll, I'll just go. I'll leave here. So I knew I had to get to Road 46, which is where Kevin was waiting for me to, to pace. The, the next crew accessible aid station, 27 That's miles correct. further. Yeah. Was that a lie? Had Taylor's crew actually left? Or? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Taylor, I think... I might have to get a hold of Taylor on this one, but somebody told his crew to leave before Jesse gets up so that he doesn't have a ride. Good. And I, I think it was the, the girl that was in the aid station. Yeah. I told them that. Um, so yeah, I'm on my own heading toward um, the next aid station, which is, uh, what is that? The, name the, needles. the needles. And I also slept for another five minutes, I think, because this one, I didn't set my watch. I just found a spot on the side of the road. Maybe this was probably five miles out of the aid station, something like yeah. that. After just I had in, just slept 30 minutes. Just kind of in the ditch yeah. on the side of the road. Yeah. On the side of the road. Yeah. I said, I, I'm going to lay down. However long I sleep, I sleep. And I don't, I, I didn't set a watch, so I don't know what time, how long it lasted, but I do remember waking up because I was freezing because it was cold. At that point, mm -hmm. it was cold. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I slept for more than three, three minutes, maybe four. Uh, before I woke up and and I was also sore because I was just lying on the ground so I, I was sore and cold so I got up and kept going and then I remember saying to myself that okay where's this where's this damn aid station it's like it can't be that far away I was like what is going on I was kept getting to this road then I got to a blacktop road and I'm on the blacktop road and it's curving around and I'm looking, mm -hmm. I, I seem like I was looking at my phone every five minutes to see my progression, to see how much longer I have to get to the next aid station. And I had a turning point and I'm like, wait a minute, why are you so interested in trying to get to the next aid station? It's like you pretty much just left the last one. What, what makes you think that you should be at the next aid station like that? Mm. Like it's going to take time. It's, mm. And it's like, wait. So I was like, we live in a world of instant gratification, right? You throw something on Instagram, you want to see everybody's, what they said about it, or you get a news flash and you can you get the news immediately. Or if you want something, you get it right now. Like we even get, uh, I get frustrated if I go into a store and there's somebody that's blocking the aisle for two seconds. Like, yeah. Just wait, they'll move. Like, why are you such a rush to get around them? And I was like, we live in a world of instant gratification. And I'm like, you know what, this race should be, or this run, is, I always like to call it a run, even though it turned into a race. It's, it, it's always a race for me, but I try to keep that aspect. Is um, instead of instant gratification, we should be relying on delayed gratification because that's all this race is. Yeah. Is should be delayed gratification. You should like enjoy the time from aid station to aid yeah. station. What What you're experiencing right now is what you should view as this is what it should be. That's the event. It's right not now. to hang out at the aid stations. It's the running in between it. And it's funny because you, we, we, we tend to think, or we tend to, to work through these events by thinking aid station to aid station. Like, okay, how far to the next one? 14 miles. Yep. Okay. How, you know, so that, that helps. I think, especially when you're a newer runner, it helps to think, to break it down. It makes it more manageable, but you're right. We can, go too far with that where now we're just all we're concerned about is getting to the next aid station yeah. it's like no no like enjoy shea mountain enjoy, enjoy the deserts like yeah. you know like enjoy that's that hummingbird that just landed on that flower yeah like you can see right now if you're feeling good like and i sometimes do this a little bit too where i'm like i'm feeling so good right now i'm in a flow i hope it takes a while to get to the next aid station because that means i'm putting more time on the guy behind me you know so sometimes you can think of it that way too where it's like you want to be in that moment and and enjoy that process but you're right. It's like it's we can we can get too focused on that next milestone. Yeah. Yeah. So I got to that aid station with very little power on my phone. Like it was nil to almost nothing. And guess what? I got rid of my power bank. Yeah. So now I have no way to even navigate. So I get to the aid station at Needles. And yeah, they had this vibe going on with like this Maybe it was orchestra music. I can't really remember. I was just like, this is kind of a weird. They got tables with like flowers set on them with 
yeah. with like tablecloths table and cloths and I remember <laughs> sitting there going, Hey, I was like, so how long ago did Taylor leave here? Again, I'm in race mode ish. Yeah. And they're like, Oh, there's a guy over there sleeping. If that's Taylor, I was like, Oh, he's still here. Oh, okay. He's here sleeping. I was like, does anybody have any, you know, a cord to pow- plug into power? And they're like, yeah. So they gave me their power bank and their cord. Nice. And I stayed there long enough to get my phone charged, what I thought yeah. to be long enough to get to the next aid station. And I was like, and they said, do you need anything? I was like, well, I see you have a, like, you guys don't have an espresso here, do you? He's like, yeah, we got, we got the, the, the same exact thing that I grew my espresso in, like the little barista uh, pot that you, mm-hmm. they're like, yeah, whatever you want. We got it. We got espresso, we got this, we got that. So they had everything there. And they brewed yeah. me up a coffee, and I had a coffee. In the meantime, Taylor got up, um, yeah. and he's getting stuff together, and I'm charging my power bank. And then all of a yeah. sudden, um, Taylor leaves, and in comes Aaron. Ooh, and this is that close. Boring. Aaron's sitting down. And now I realize I have a funny thing to say about this whole trip around that every aid station where there was crew accessibility, I kept hearing these people say Aaron's coming in. He actually came into Monticello Lake also while I was there. So Aaron was Mm -hmm. there. But as I'm going all the way to Monticello Lake, I kept thinking to myself, this Aaron person must be Taylor. And Taylor is his real name. And they name him like Name or it's like his Aaron. middle name or something yeah. and yeah they're calling they're calling taylor aaron because there's no aaron i don't know who this aaron person is yeah yeah that's so that's 150 sudden, mile logic for you right yeah all yeah. of a sudden this aaron who i'm thinking is actually taylor pops into the aid station so he's third place and they're like oh how you doing you're doing great he's like yeah he's like a lot of the a lot of the front runners were not sleeping but i i've been sleeping and i think that works to my advantage He's like, yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've took, taken a couple naps and he's like, and they said, and he goes, how, how far ahead is first and second? And I, I was like, well, you're looking at second right now. And he's like, but before he said that, he's like, yeah, it's coming to be daytime. I would get some coffee in. Um, he's like, and then I'm going hunting. He's like, how Oof. far ahead is first and second? I was like, well, you're looking at second right now. I told that him that wow. and then I left. And that kind of lit that, that kind of lit a fire in me. I'm like, wait, he he's going hunting. Okay, well his hunt's gonna have to. It's starting right now. So I kind of got into race mode at that point. Like, I was always in sort of a little bit of a race mode. You could, I, I didn't really feel like I was in race mode, but yeah, I was. But and that next twelve miles was rolling, but good running terrain. Yeah, very good running terrain. Yeah, I ate a lot. I I feel like I set myself up for success. Oh yeah, I was heading to Road Forty Six. Yeah, I, I yeah. heard you say Kes- you it, you you had left that aid station. You had a quesadilla. You had this. You had that. I had a breakfast you ate a, wrap. You I, ate a lot of quesadillas. <laughs> I ate a lot of quesadillas because they're. I, I find they go. I think I had like three quesadillas. I had a couple of egg breakfasts both mornings. I had wow. egg breakfast. I wouldn't always finish it. Like sometimes, like you know, like yeah. that that time they gave me this big plate. I'm like, this is dry. a lot of food. <laughs> it's yeah, you're trying to choke it down. Exactly, it's dry because you're thirsty. I didn't eat a lot of it. So I'm like, can you wrap this? Like, yeah, they put it in like a wrap, which I should have just got to begin with and left. I like to eat while I walk. And then I ate like half of it and I carried this stupid, you know, like you don't need a lot of calories. You just need, you need constant calories, right? Yeah. But you don't need like a whole meal all at once. So, yeah. I do remember um, before the race ever went off, Michele uh, Gregalia, that was the first place finisher a couple of years ago. Yeah, I know him. He told me, He's like, as long as you can do like 10 minute miles on that, on those flats, mm. he's like, you're, you're, you'll be golden. As long as you can mm-hmm. run a little bit on there. Because those and- sections they're like, there's some tough parts of this course climbing, but there's some really long runnable sections. Yeah, so as, as long, long as, as you you're jogging, run, yeah. you're just shuffling Even if it's 12 minutes. Yeah. It if you can shuffle for two, three hours at a time, yeah, that's how you do well in this race. So I had that in my mind. I caught Taylor out of the aid station probably two miles out. And I told him what Aaron said, that Aaron's yeah. going hunting. Uh, he's like, oh, okay. And at that point, he was, he had had at one, at the previous year, had a Achilles tendon that was, a, that, that, that fired up and got so bad that he ended up dropping at Geyser Pass. Mm. 
the year before. Mm -hmm. And he was speaking of that, um, I think before we ever got to that point, but he and his pacer were there on that road. I caught him kind of where you see in the film, there's a nice like arch. Yeah. Yeah. Right about there is where I caught him. And it was, it was early morning at that point. Um, so that was pretty close to road 46 then I think. Yeah. Like that was fairly. Well, so I caught him about two to three miles out of the aid station. I'm going to say two miles out. I caught him. And uh, we had an interesting exchange. He's like, hey, Jesse, he's like, I, um, he's like, I'm not too sure, you know, how I want to attack this. I've, I've talked to him since then about this exact spot. And he's like, yeah, what you said was a little inaccurate. He's like, I wasn't asking you, like, what we, what you think we should do for this race. He was just like, I was asking you for, like, your opinion on what you think about how to go about you know, not getting this injury because the, the, the flat road was putting a lot of pressure on that Achilles tendon and it was, mine was already in flame. I, it mm -hmm. was to the point where I was like, it was hurting a lot and his was just yeah. starting. And he was like, um, he's like, should we, should I, you know, should I back off? Should I go? I was like, well, honestly, Taylor, I was like, I never really came into this, into this, um, into this Moab 240 as it being a race. I was like, it's always been a run. So I'm, I'm not like really competitive about it, but I said, uh, cause he, I think he was interested in knowing whether or not we should like work together. I, th I thought he said work together and like pace each other or, or hang out, mm. you know, work with each other. It was a little foggy for me at that point, but what mm -hmm. I was gathering was he was asking me if we should just like, you know, hike, hike this section so he doesn't get injured. And I was like, Honestly, Taylor, I was like, my Achilles is already hurting. My knee hurts. My my uh, hamstrings hurt. My hip flexors hurt. I was like, I just need to keep going so I can get to the next aid station. So I'm just going to keep jogging. And he was like, he and his pacer saw me like, like a quarter mile later. My knee was really hurting too. I was just like hmm. sitting in one spot and like rotating my knee around, trying to get it to loosen yep. up um, and massage it a little bit. And he, he told his pacer, he's like, he's like, yeah, he's like, I'm not even really that injured. And look at Jesse said that he had all those problems and he's up there running and look at, he's up there like trying to work something out. He's like, look, let's go with him. So he, he ended up, he and his pacer ended up like running with, we ran together, which is good because my phone was actually dead. I had no power to it. So I couldn't even navigate. This is probably where I'm starting to maybe catch you a little bit. I mean, I must have been putting some time on, uh, let's see, row 46. I was fourth coming out of uh, the needles. So and I couldn't have been too, too far, far behind. behind. No. Um, and uh, maybe I made up some time because where, you know, it sounds like you guys were, you were moving, but you were hurting a yeah. bit. I felt great on that section of row 46. Like I was like, yeah, everything's yeah. moving well. My body felt 100%. And so I think I probably, I must have made up some time on that section. It'd be interesting to look at the tracker. You did. Yeah, you did. Yeah, because you were like the. It looked like the time of day based on the movie mm. was really close to the times that we were coming into yeah. Road Forty Six, mm -hmm. and I don't know if this is the case, but we should look at the tracker because yeah. I think I heard somebody say fourth place is coming in right when I was mm. leaving Road Forty Six. Okay, you guys you were gone made... when I got there. You were oh, gone when I got there, but I didn't stop for very long. Okay, I I ate, I changed my shoes, like I did. I did my usual thing. I didn't sleep, and then I got out of there and I took food for the road. So you've made up um, a lot of time there, then, because I got okay. in the road forty six, and that's the first time I saw my pacer, and that's the first time that we ever like. I had met him before because he was yeah. at one of my wife's races and we exchanged yeah. a couple things, but my wife has a lot of races and there's a lot of people there. I didn't remember ever like meeting and talking to him. So it's yeah. going to be like our first interaction. Yeah. So I got to road 46 and ate another hamburger. I actually had somebody that was, that was the aid station volunteer. He, I, I, I asked somebody, I was like, does anybody know how to tape, tape up, you know, Pete, you know, the, um, KT tape, yeah. Yeah. And he's like, ah, oh, my my girlfriend's a PT. I could do it for you. So I took all my shoe my shoe off my shoe off and he taped up my my leg. And cause I thought it was like gonna blow out. 
That's how mm. bad it was. And he's like, mm. where is it? And it was swollen to the point. He's like, where does it hurt? Right here or right here? And it wasn't that the attachment. It was in the belly of the Achilles. So he's like, oh, you're oh. fine. It's not pulling away. You're good. So he taped it up. I ended up sleeping there for 45 minutes. Because Kevin got to be friends with the ham radio operators. Because when he got there, I was, I was supposed to be there like 10 hours earlier. Let's see. I was supposed to be there at... Uh, nine fifty six a.m. Yeah, this is based on your original projection of a sixty no, hour. Sorry, finishing 150, time. Right, one fifty five a.m. I was supposed to be there. Yeah, so he thought he was going to start pacing at one fifty five at two in the morning. Yeah, and it's what eleven a.m. And it's nine nine fifty six ten a.m. Yeah, it's ten a.m. When yeah. I got there, so you slept there. I slept there for forty five minutes. Okay, uh, in a camper like away from all noise. So I had nice. a really good sleep. Nice. That probably helped you. That was make it through the race. That probably so was an instrumental nap. Yeah. Changing because yeah. I left there and I remember Kevin and I were talking. Aaron left yeah. before me. I'm not, I left there in third place. Aaron passed me. Oh that. yeah. He got there. Didn't sleep at all. Okay. Or if he did, it was very short time. And quality of sleep, that. quality of sleep matters, in my opinion, as much, if not more than quantity, like having like you and, and also what 45 minutes, you're getting like a good like REM cycle as well. Like you can't you can't just do three minute naps like you got to have no. a good and like you said, quiet, like warm camper van like those. Yeah, that was probably your most important like decision was, was to lie down there. Was. Yeah, yep, for sure. So yeah. yeah, Aaron left ahead of me. Taylor okay. Left ahead of me. So we're at mile 170. So you went out, you're in third place. And that section was tough, right? Up to Pole Canyon. We're climbing again. For me, it was hot. I ran out of water again <laughs> for the third time. So that was, I found that section, that 15, 16 miles to Pole Canyon, really tough. So how was that for you? It was hot. I do remember it being hot. I also remember it's the thing where my mental state was, I just had a nap. I have this new person that I've never really spent any time with. So I'm getting to know him. We're telling stories. Time's passing. Time's passing fast. Yeah, yeah we passed Aaron. Right. Like maybe two, we, we hiked with Aaron for like maybe a half mile to a mile mm -hmm. together. Gives you a bit Three of a boost. Of us. Yeah. 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 It's a new day. It's a yeah. like it's a new. I hadn't even done. It was a new race. As it, it felt like brand new. Like I'm just getting mm -hmm. started. Um. So we we crushed that section. We got into yeah. the next aid station with Taylor and his pacer being coming in 30 seconds ahead of us. And he left 15 minutes before us. Okay. So you made up 15 minutes on Taylor heading into Pole Canyon, a non crew accessible aid station. You see it in the film there. I stop and have a burger. Me we, too. We got him for, we got him for the road. Um, when I came in, Aaron was there in the chair. Oh. I don't think I was clear in the film. He was sitting there and Aaron came I, in I, right behind us. Like, okay, so that shows you how close we were. So, so there was overlap there. He came in when you were in that aid station. I came in when he was there, and I sat down and I said, "I'll get a burger." Taste and said to, and I said, "Oh yeah, we'll get him to go." And Aaron looks at us. He's like, uh "Oh," and he he started grabbing stuff and realizing I better get out of here because that was. And Taste and after was like, "I I thought we'd be hanging out there." I'm like, "No man, we're get our food to go." Like we, you know, we filled up our bottles. We, you know, it still nice. takes ten minutes, right? So that put a bit of pressure on him. He left. He he got out of there. But that's when that next section is when the sun went down. And that's when I think the race was on, right? Because so, Paul Cannon to Geyser Pass, 15 miles, another big climb. And that's where I caught up with Taylor and, and Aaron within like a 200 meter section. You must, it must have been like two miles in before you ever caught them because I think it, it was a, at least a couple of, at least a few miles because the sun, maybe even more, maybe even five, six miles okay, because the sun sense. had gone down. We were climbing and um, Taysen jokes about it in the film. And I explained it to him after, like we, we caught up with Aaron, but we didn't quite pass him. I was messing around. I want to make sure that pass was decisive. So like I was getting too warm, like, no, I want to stop, take my jacket off. I want to eat. Like, you know that, you know that thing you, you do in a race? hanging around you. Well, no. And I want to know when I passed them, I could pass them. So I want to make sure I had just eaten, that I, I was ready to go, that I was oh, yeah, in climb smart. mode. So so we took about 10 minutes to get ready to make that pass. And I explained this to Taysen after, and he's like, okay, that makes sense. Cause he's, he's newer to ultra running. And so um, he saw it as being this slow pass. And I was like, no, I'm preparing. Cause when we pass them, we want, we want to just like be able to move. And so we did, but then right as we passed them, 
Taylor was there and he was actually stopped on the side of the trail with his getting his puffy jacket on. And we were like, Ooh, that doesn't look good. Like I'm sweating on the climb and he's putting his jacket on. So yeah, we left there and maybe in a matter of less than two miles, maybe a mile, we caught Taylor because okay. he left the aid station before us, before Kevin and I left. Yeah. So then we started climbing and I could see Taylor up there and I felt, mm -hmm. I felt invigorated, good, mm -hmm. um, it was pretty steep, right? Like it, it, it was pretty really much steep. straight yeah. up. Yeah. 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 It was really steep. And I could see yeah. Taylor was going a little bit slower than us. So I didn't tell Kevin this, but uh, my pacer, but I knew that this was a point where I was like, we need to pass Taylor, just like you said, and be decisive about it and show him that there's like no chinks in the armor. Yeah. So I actually pushed, we were, we were pushing, but we were talking too. So it wasn't like we were running, you know, yeah. we were, I was still able to talk while we were doing it, I, obviously out of breath as we're doing it. So I put, I, I elevated my heart rate just a mm -hmm. bit too much, I think, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. still wanted to get around him. And he talked to me later about it. He's like, yeah, when you guys passed me, when you were, you passed us so fast and you were talking while you were doing it. I was like, oh my God, they're going to be gone. He's like, yeah. yeah, this is not good for me. He's like, they're, they're definitely have, have, have it going on. That's so one of those psychological kind of yeah. tricks, right? Like I'm not like, the most competitive athlete. I'm not, you know, like you're, you're obviously playing these games a lot more where you're always racing at the front, but there's this idea of like being out of sight, out of mind. Like if you can get ahead of somebody, especially at night and, you know, well, oh yeah, hiding your headlamp a little bit, like just really <laughs> getting out of sight. It makes the person just go, ah, oh, as opposed yeah. to like, oh, he's still right in front of me. I can yeah. catch him again. So we didn't let up. I, I needed yeah. to make sure that we put a gap on him. So that was to the point where it was like, so we kept, yeah. we pretty much kept that pace up and Kevin was, you know, he's a strong runner. So he was interested in pushing on. And I think, like I said, it might've been a little bit of a, 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 a wrong move or a, maybe a mistake on my part or just to push that hard because the pulmonary mm -hmm. edema started again. And now we're going up to that. Almost 11,000, I think. And I'm getting to the point where I'm like, it's getting tough to breathe granted it took at least what was that section 10 miles i mean 15 15 15 to guys so it took yeah. about t took about 10 miles for me to get to the point where i was like oh man this is hitting me and the other thing was is it went there was a lot of up and down like yeah he was telling me he's like we're gonna yeah. climb up it's gonna be 2500 feet of, and you know it in kilometers no it, and there were overgrown sections remember yeah. where you're like, like you're like are we on the course like what I is happening asking him, i was like yeah. this is why you're here to keep us on course and he was like oh yeah no he kept telling me we're, we're good we're gonna climb up this this piece and then we're gonna you know that's the yeah. highest point and then we're gonna start going down well, that happened like four times and I started I, to get no, upset. No, it, it was weird. And I'm yeah. like, why are we going? I was like, we're going down again. I was like, I thought we we're mm -hmm. supposed to finish at a peak. That means we need to mm -hmm. go back up. And by the third time, I'm like, dude, that's enough of this. I was like, we need to look. How far are we from this aid station? Because I was like, I've been out of water. for This is the first time I actually ran out of water in okay. this section. Yeah. I was like, I'm out of water and I've, I've, I've been out of water for like a mile and a half. He's like, no, the aid station is just up here. And I open up my phone and I'm looking at it and I'm like, Kevin, we're going the wrong way. We're not even on course. I mean, we're on course, but we're going the wrong direction. And I was just out of it. He's like, no, I, I was with you, man. I, I mean, I wasn't getting as frustrated, but I was, it was like, what? Like we, Tasa and I were like, what is happening? Like at one point we're like on the side of a cliff going down switchbacks yeah. and you're climbing back up and it felt like. You know, and I think there was that little bit of pressure where I was running scared now from Aaron. So I didn't want to let up. And it was and like, saw, yeah, we saw headlamps behind us. Like there was one portion of the course. I was like, I was like, Kevin, I was like, they're right behind us. And I was like, it's not just Taylor and his pacer. I was like, there's like three sets, three different groups of people. The train was like this. Yes. So that would happen to us too, where, you know, I'd, I'd hide my headlamp and kind of turn around and I could see a lamp, but it was probably like. 15 minutes worth of terrain, sure. but it looked like they were like right it there. Like you're right yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we stopped to get water literally a quarter of a mile from the aid station, but Kevin was great. He like, he's like, he whips his pack off. He gets the bottle. He gets, fills it up. He's like, let's go. So, and, and we pop out into the, into the parking lot for, for geyser pass and who's yeah. there is like a lifesaver. Jeff Browning was there. He's mm -hmm. like, dude, right over here. He's like, I got whatever you need. What do you need? He's like, I got this 
I got this chair. I got this blanket. I was like, oh, awesome. And I'm kind of out of it. And he's like, what do you need? I was like, I need a burger and a hot chocolate. He's like, okay. And he, he gets all that stuff from me. He's like, here, just lay down. I was like, I think I want to sleep too. He's like, okay, that's fine. How long do you want to sleep? I said, I want to sleep about 20 minutes. And as he's getting the burger for me, oh, and his wife had um, had this, uh, it's called Breathies. So she's putting it on me and mm. my hands were super swollen. And she was like, oh my God. I remember her saying, she's like, you're so swollen. I was like, yeah, I know. My hands were just swelled, swelled up. I was like, and my, I was like, my Achilles is killing me. And I got into that zero gravity chair or something like that. And I laid back and, I, and, and uh, before I actually went to sleep, he's like, oh, oh, here's second place, Jeff. And I'm like, second place? I was like, second place isn't Jeff. There's no Jeff. I was like, it's Taylor. He's like, no, this Jeff guy, he's been moving up. He just got in. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, yeah, but go ahead, take your twenty minute nap. I heard them talking. He's gonna be, he's gonna sleep for an hour. Okay. We, we, I think my crew was talking a little bit loud there. Just yeah. twenty minutes, just twenty minutes. Yeah. And uh, and I woke up from it because I heard him and his wife out there, you know, whispering. I'm up. Don't worry about it. I was like, and uh, they're like, okay, you need anything else? I was like, I was like, oh, I remember also that that zero gravity chair had my Achilles tendon. There was a bar right where it was Ooh. resting on it. So when I woke up, I was like, oh, my God, my Achilles hurts so much. I was like, I don't know if I can keep going. And it was just because of the pain of it. And uh -huh. uh, um, But she had some, oh, that's what she had, these little Arnica pills. I don't know if you've ever seen them. They're the ones you can put under your tug, their tongue. They're like, I don't know if that had some sort of effect on, you know, just placebo effect. But it seemed like the Achilles tendon kind of dissipated later on. But yeah, I had one more hot chocolate and then Jeff's in my ear telling me, he's like, all right, this next piece you're going to go. He's like, you're just going to just start out, just, just work your way into it. He's like, it's going to be a long climb up to the top. And then you're going to hit this single track, pretty buffed mm -hmm. out. There's, you know, you're going to head down to this, uh, to this blacktop road and it's going to swing around mm -hmm. to a campground. And then you're going to hit the campground. Then you're going to go to another trail. I was like, looked at him like, how do you remember all this? I was like, it was just like, you did it last year, but I was like, it's like detail for detail. He's like, I don't know. That's just the way my mind, mind works. So he got me out of the aid station. I start hiking up the road and he's hiking with me, just telling me, you know, giving me some encouragement. He's like, yeah, if you just keep, just keep a good pace. He's like, Jeff's going to leave the aid station. You know, he's, he's going to be a ways behind you. If you just keep a good pace and you just maintain, he's like, you got this. So I left that aid station. Um, and I have a couple things to say on the way to the next aid station. So if you had anything else for your trip up to Geyser from- I slept there my last, my third and final nap. So I'd slept an hour 45. I slept one more hour. And unfortunately, like I, I kind of like, I woke up and then I was like, oh, maybe I'll sleep another 10 minutes. And I couldn't fall back. I kind of wasted time. I know I wasted 10 or 15 minutes. Just, I just wasn't like, I should have just, you know, I think Audrey was really trying to take care of me and make sure I was set up for success. But in hindsight, that's when I should have, we should have said, okay, that hour nap is getting cut to 30 minutes. I got to chase Jesse. And we didn't. Yeah. And that was the, that hindsight. was the mistake. Hindsight could have also screwed up my race, but yeah. that's where I've kind of been saying, I've done a couple of these podcast interviews, like about the race, you've done a couple as well. And I've kind of been saying, um, I had a plan A and a plan B and a plan C, but I didn't have a plan for what would happen if I ended up in second place with first place, like an hour ahead of me. And that's where it yeah. should have been like, okay, throw the plan out the window or let's, let's think on our feet here. Let's adapt. And instead I was, st I was sticking to my plan, I think too much, but again, maybe that, maybe that could have hurt you, could have helped you, could have hurt me. Never, we'll never know. You never know. But I left there. You were over, I know over an hour ahead of me. I think it's an hour and five wow. minutes according to the tracker. But as I left there, a couple things happened in the next section. And it happened to me at least three times before I ever got up to the climb that you hit before you get to the single track. And that is that I would be hiking, 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 breathing good. And all of a sudden, I get to the point where I was like, I would just be sitting there like this. And I would wake up. And I'm like, whoa. I was like, how long was I asleep? And I would start hiking again. And it would happen again. Yeah. And it happened like three different times before I got to yeah. the single track. Um, so I don't know if I slept, I could have slept 
10 minutes. I could have slept two minutes or 30 seconds. I have no idea, but I was out of it to the point where the hallucinations started for me. Not so much the hallucinations to begin with. First, my mind started working. Like I started hitting the single track and I was like upset with myself. I was like, and with the race organizers, I'm like, why did they send us down this trail when we didn't, we don't have tools. We don't have the things we need to make the trail better. And it's like these rocks are here and I need to have a, a pickaxe to move the stuff out of the way. And I don't have, I don't have a machete to hit the branches that are hitting me in the face. And I, that, that was all going through my head until I got down to this buffed road where I was like down far enough where I could look back up and I could see headlamps coming. I saw I me like, too, man. I saw Aaron behind. I was like, Oh yeah. no. I was like, Jeff yeah. is on me. So it's at that point where I was like, I need to go. I need to get going. I was like, so as soon as I hit that buffed out road, I put in a turn of speed that was like, like, I, obviously it's not super fast because you're are all sore and stuff, but I know that I was pushing over the, over what I should have being still whatever it is, 30 miles out. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember also one time like covering up my headlamp and looking back mm-hmm. to see yeah. if, you were actually coming how close you were and i remember being what i thought to be down to the bottom of the road and looking back up i was like oh shoot he's like right there so i did something critically bad which is i dumped all the water out of my bottles and like wasted some of the water in my pack not knowing that i still had like 10 miles to go with some climbing with with a little <laughs> bit of climbing yeah i didn't I didn't look at the course. I didn't know where I was going. I mean, I didn't know the terrain. Never been there before. I knew I had to get to Porcupine, and then that would be the last aid station to go. Mm-hmm. And as I'm going down this road, I'm seeing, like, the trees, the brush and stuff. For me, it was like I saw a lawnmower, and I saw, until I got close enough, I saw a bulldozer. <laughs> I saw an excavator. I saw a horse yeah. and buggy. Yeah, yeah. I saw all these things in the shadows of, of, as my yeah. headlamp's hitting it. And... I remember a couple times just stopping just because I wanted to stop. I was like, I need to pee. So I would make an excuse to stop. So yeah, I was, yeah, I, I yeah. Would, I'd start to think I was going to go pee and I just stood there and I was. I, I'm the same way. I, I, and I feel like in the moment, like, no, I got to take care of this. I better stop. Yeah. And, you know. Yeah. And I remember a couple, one of the times I was like, I think I just fell asleep. I literally was trying to pee and I was just fell asleep. Well, I was. I think, I think you mentioned this when we did talk right after the race there, I was like weaving back and forth. Like I was asleep on my feet and I would kind of wake up as I like hit the ditch. Like when I hit the train, I'd go on oh, but I was moving. I was running while I was doing it. And I remember in the moment thinking if, if a car comes behind me, I'm dead. Like, I, I don't know where I am on the road. I'm just back and forth. Um, I had, I had a little bit of navigational issues on a couple points on the road. I think I was just second guessing. I was like, this is too easy. Like, are we literally just running on this road? Oh. And I kept second guessing and there was one spot where I could have sworn a flag took us off the road. And I was like, what the hell? Like where, and I was, you know, and it, it, I don't know if it was a different one. Yeah. I don't know. It was, it was, I I was having some hard, I I, I was just second guessing myself a lot, even though it it should have been a really easy section, but my mind was playing tricks to me a little bit. I just remember opening up my app a lot and making sure I was still on course and like yeah. trying to zoom it down to see the distance that I had gone from geyser to where mm-hmm. I was and like trying to take my fingers and go, okay, that mm-hmm. took me from there to there. I got this much left. It's like, shoot, I guess still mm-hmm. have over half the distance to go. Uh, and I couldn't see your headlamp up ahead. And I think cause you were hiding it and it I was, was just, it every time so I, I was second guessing. Look, I was like, well, where did Jesse go? Like, yeah. So I was really, I was just second guessing myself, but then, as we were approaching Porcupine Rim, maybe just a few miles out, I could have sworn that I saw Derek, who was occasionally I'd see him on course filming me. Dude, and we, he was out there. And I thought he was going to be there. And then I thought I had seen him like miles before I saw him. And oh. then and then I saw him, but then I second guessed if I did see him because we made sure to like, we, we talked about this before, like that he wouldn't give me any emotional support. He wouldn't give me like encouragements. If I saw him, I'd pretend I didn't see him. Like we kind of talked about that. And I think he said something like, like, nice work, dude. Like just something like really, like really small. And I remember being like, was that, was, did that just happen? And then for like two miles, I thought he had his drone up in the air. So I'm seeing his drone, but I'm seeing them all over. I'm like, how many drones did Derek bring? 
And they were like these shooting stars or satellites. And I'm seeing them everywhere. I'm like, holy shit, Derek has like 10 drones up here. I didn't know he owned that many drones. Like it was just, it was just, it was really weird. So I didn't even know Derek was there to film for you. But I saw him in his truck and I'm thinking to myself, oh, there's Derek. I was like, I wonder why he's taking a nap way out here. And then I started thinking, well, he's taking a nap, but he's probably close to the aid station. He's probably going to fire up his drone as soon as he sees me. Because I thought maybe he was just filming for Moab for the, for the race. And I don't remember if I saw the drone or not, but I do remember thinking, well, if he's here close to the aid station, I was like, where's the damn aid station? I was like, I think the race organizers are messing with me. Like, I'm the only one up here. I think yeah. everybody else went a different way and like already made it to the aid station. So I'm running yeah. like, I don't know, maybe I'm in third place now, but everybody else took a different route. That thought process right there, like what you just said there, it just per perfectly encapsulates where your mind goes for the last like 80 miles of an event like this. Hey, like you're constantly, I remember at one point thinking maybe, maybe you had messed with the flagging at one point because the flag was over, like no reason to think that, but I'm like, yeah. is Jesse f***ing with me? Like did he moved the flag. I thought the like, race organizers were messing with me. Yeah. And that's, and that's the thing where like you, you just, your mind is playing tricks at you the whole time. Like just constantly about every little thing, like you, and you forget a lot of this stuff. Right. But in the moment, like that's part of this is just battling the weird negative thoughts and the weird, like it's not even hallucinations per se. Like it's not like yeah. you're seeing giant pink elephants. It's no. just weird thoughts, weird rationalizations, we things that don't make any sense. No. But in so the moment you're, you're obsessed with state. this idea. Yeah. You're in dream state. You, you wake yeah. up from a dream. You're like, that was yeah. so real. Well, and in the same way that a lot of dreams are like not even that interesting, they're just variations of reality. It's kind of like that, right? Like, yeah, absolutely. So I'm on that road heading to Porcupine and I'm like running or, you know, jogging and I'm like, get coming down to a hike and I'm like I'm hiking and I'm like, no, what would Jeff do? Browning, not yeah. you. <laughs> Cause I didn't know you at the time. <laughs> like what would Jeff be doing on this? If he was racing this right now, he'd be running. Yeah. Hell yeah. He'd be running, yeah. run. So I would run and I finally come around the corner and finally see the aid station. I'm like, ah, oh, there it is. Finally. And I came in and I still needed my headlamp to get to it. But this was really yeah. weird to me in the movie. I saw that. I thought you came in or you left needing a headlamp. So I don't know how that transpired. It was right, right. As I came in, I pretty much took my headlamp off. Um, like it was pretty much right as I was leaving the aid station, the sun had just come up. Okay. Cause I needed the headlamp yeah. to get to the aid station. It was like in that 10 minute period that I was at the aid station that the sun came up for me. Wait, so you, you were, were for 10 minutes. I think so. So we'll talk about that. I don't think so. Maybe, yeah. maybe five, six. We're no, you're right. That. It was probably five or six. I came into the aid station and they're like, Oh, yay. Right. And I'm like, Hey, how far, how far behind is second place? And then, and some guys, I, I thought, because I'm obviously not fully there, I thought somebody said he's a couple miles back. I'm like, a couple miles? Okay. Or maybe they said, like, I thought I had time. Let's put it that way. Okay. Like, I knew you were close, but I knew you were close when we were at Geyser, and I knew you were close when I saw your headlamp. So now I knew you were still close, but not, yeah. like, dangerously close. Um, what is dangerously close? That's a matter of perspective, but... <laughs> Um, I remember going to the aid station, getting something to eat and then going to the bathroom. And then I was going to go get some more food. And when I came out of the bathroom, it switched. Like what they told me the first time was, I thought it was like maybe an hour, half hour to an hour that you were behind, yeah. which I thought would have been manageable to, oh, he's like a half mile out. I was like, what? A half mile out or a mile out, something like that. Yeah. I was like, I need to go. So I threw all my stuff in my pack and yeah. I started going. And they told me that you're going to go down the road about a mile and a half, and then you're going to see the trail on your right-hand side. Mm -hmm. So I'm running down this road going, he's right back there. He's right back there. I was like, I need to know how far back there he is. I was like, I need to at least hit this trail before he leaves the aid station. And this trail that's a mile and a half away. And I turned airplane mode off, fired up my phone, went to the website, all while I'm walking. I'm not, I'm not stopped by yeah. hiking trying to do all this on the, on the road. Or maybe it was after I hit the trail and I looked and I hit the trail and you were already on your way out of the aid station. 
and I'm like, shit. I was like, he he's after it. He's going. I was like, from that point, from that point, my mind was go. And yeah. every rock I hit, every step up I hit, I was just power hiking up it yeah. and going and checking the tracker and then looking back. And I was like, not there. Check the tracker again. Like every less than mile. I was like, okay, distance looks about the same. But then again, I couldn't zoom in and figure it out. And and, and the trackers, they kind of ping funny, right? So yeah. depending on when you refresh, mine might have just pinged, yours might have. Yes. So they weren't like exactly yeah. accurate. And you right? can't yeah. analyze yeah. that while you're running. So no, just, no. That's why I opened it so much too, to see how yeah. close those buttons were away from each other and looking back. But I was like, yeah. this looking back isn't helping because I don't I have no idea no. where the trail is. Where did I come no. from? I mean, so I had run the section from Porcupine Rim to the finish. I'd made sure I did that because I love, like, I like discovering a course for the first time, but with the exception of the final leg, I always like to know the final leg, right? Because that's so easy to screw. It's so easy to screw it up. And it's nice to know when to start to layer it on. So I'd run that section. So I was really looking forward to that. I knew it was all downhill. Well, there were some, right, you know, steps and stuff, but for the most part, downhill, a little bit technical, but even that, I kind of knew the lines I was going to take from having run it. And uh, so I was really looking forward to that. I felt like I spent a lot of time in Porcupine, but you're right. It was probably five minutes. It was more like in hindsight, I spent too much time because I filled up my bladder. I filled up my bottles because when I ran this in training, I did it in the heat of the day mm -hmm. and it took me like four hours and I ran out of water and I was like, it was a hot, hard run. We did it in like half that time and I didn't drink any water. So like I'm dumping my water out now thinking like, this is ridiculous. Like I'm halfway done, you know, jumping ahead here, but 10 miles out, I'm dumping my water. Like, why did I waste my time filling up my bladder? But that's all in hindsight, right? Yeah. I had, I'd, I'd stopped to get pancakes. And in the end, I could have just Me too. gone with, I, I could have just gone with the food I had in my, yeah, in my pack, probably. you yeah. know, like when it comes down to minutes, right. I could have saved a few minutes, but, but yeah. So at that point we were back in cell service. So we had the tracker. Right. And yeah. it was cell service was spotty at best for the rest of the race. But now we had cell service yeah. and we would until the end. So you and I, but we're both. And I thought you had a pacer. So I was looking ahead constantly. Like I'm looking at the, at the thing going like he should be right there, right, over there. right before the bend. And it felt like you were always just one bend ahead and of every me time on I the trail. Looked, it looked like you were right back there. So I kept I could back. never get eyes on you. And it was the most frustrating thing. And then I, I sometimes I'd have to stop and pinch and drag. I'm like, this is, I'm wasting time here. But I thought I was going to catch you on that, the trail. It's 20, 21 miles to the finish and about 12 to 15 miles of it. How long is the road? It's a good 12 miles of trail. Three miles is the road. Yeah. So 12 miles or so of trail and some of it's like pretty technical, but it's definitely trail. Like it's, you know, double track, single track. And I, I, I thought I was going to catch you on that section. And I was so surprised when I didn't. And I was running, I, I got, you know, at first I was trying to conserve, but it's, well, at some point I'm like, I got to, I better start sprinting. Like this I is was, like, I was I'm running same. out of I'm running out of time. I got to start I was running. Like, I was like, I need to maintain a good pace, but not go to the point where it's going to crush me so that I can't yeah. have something left at the end but i don't want to give back all the time yeah that we had between the aid stations so if i can if i can yeah. maintain this gap and we can get that all the way to the point where it's go time i was like i need to just have a little bit of conser conservation so that mm -hmm. i have something for go but now all of a sudden i'm my left achilles was killing me 100 miles to go or 80 miles to go whatever it was now my right Achilles jumping up and down those steps mm. and stuff on that flat rock. Now my right Achilles was doing the same thing. I'm like, oh no. I'd been told coming out of road, uh, sorry, Geyser Pass, like Jesse's not looking so good. And I think that, I wish I didn't hear that because they said he's coughing and he's having, I think somebody said, I think he's having some problem with his feet and yeah. it was probably your Achilles. Achilles. And I wish I hadn't heard that because it made me think, okay, I, I, I got this. Oh, you got I'll catch time. him. You got time I'll catch him. And I was thinking, if he's having problems with his feet and he's coughing, there's no way he's going to get to the sprint. Like that road sprint, worst case, I'll pass him on the road at the end. I it, Had I not heard that, I would have thought like, okay, like I better work. You know, I, I would have probably worked harder because in the back of my mind, I'm thinking like, I should, I, I should be catching him if he truly is in as bad of a state as they said he was. 
And somehow you were able to rise above that. No, like, I pretty you, much was in that bad state as they were talking. Well, I felt great. And then this guy, somebody was there filming or taking photos at one point. I don't know if you passed him. At and no, sorry. This is this is like heading down the trail now, getting close to oh, the road. Yeah, I thought he was with you. No, I thought he was with you. And so he he was taking photos and he ran. I think he was running with me for a bit, like filming me. And that gave me a boost. And I'm like, this is awesome. I'm sprinting. I'm like, oh, he's, and then I, I, he's I, a taller guy, right? Like, yeah. Taller guy. I think no, he was no in a shirt. blue shirt. No shirt. Oh, maybe no shirt. I, I don't quite remember, but I remember just, he was just in the middle, like in just some he random in guy in the middle, yeah. in the middle of nowhere. And there was this one like step up. You had to like really lunge to get up and any day it would have been fine. But in that moment, I just didn't have quite the power. It's kind of like doing a box jump and missing the top. And I missed the top and I just slammed. Mm. Like body, like shoulder first, boom, into oh, the rock, no. running as hard as I could be running downhill. And in that moment, I'm like, oh. this, this is how it ends. Six miles from the finish, my race is over. And I got up and I brushed myself off. I'm like, I'm okay. I'm okay. Nothing's broken. Nothing's. And I kind of, and that guy at this point, he passed me and took off. Didn't even say anything. Didn't even check if I was okay. And then, okay. which whatever, that's fine. But, and then. I, I was like, oh my God. And I kept going, but that was like, I almost Dang. threw it all away Oof. right in that moment. Yeah, and I, then yeah, I thought he was with you. No, but then I finally got you on my sights. There was yeah. this turn in the Canyon and it's a tricky part. And I actually, it's funny. I'd run it before and I still took the wrong way. The first time I had to come back up and, and it sort of drops down and it's kind of a bit of a scramble and climb up the other side. Up, yeah. And so you and me were within 30 feet but you could see it was like 30 feet but yeah. another yeah but it was like around. five minutes to get around it or yeah. a few minutes right yeah at least it was at least I'm, I'm saying if you were to just like do it in a normal yeah. run i would say it was about 30 seconds is what i thought it was but maybe it was longer than that it could, yeah, yeah yeah okay it's a few minutes yeah then again i okay, think I, screw, I screwed it up a little bit too but That's i saw I you saw him i saw that guy there too he was with I you i heard i heard footsteps and i looked he was back right and, I, and and I was like, I stood there for a second, like dumbfounded, like looking at him. And he's like, oh, don't worry. I'm not racing. I was like, oh, okay, good. But I still in my mind was like, that that guy was with Jeff. I thought he was your pacer. No. And then I was thinking, oh, that's weird that Jesse's pacer ran back to me to film yeah. me. No. And then ran and caught up with Jesse. Uh -huh. So so I see the two of you running. He was right yeah, behind so you. Yeah, he's right, right behind ahead of me. You. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. you said, Jesse? And I'm like, yep. It's not, funny that you remember not, it that way. Probably I not said, that excited. But. No, in, in my mind, I said, Jesse, because I wanted you to know that I was right there hotting your tail. I, want, I didn't want to like sneak up on you at the end of a 240 mile race. Oh. And so when I saw you, I wanted, Man, it, it, all I was like, Jesse. And I, I expected you to be like, dude. And then us to have a little like, let's do like, you know, let's, let's, let's do this. Let's finish sprint. this. Let's, yeah. let's finish this together. Like, like racing. You know, I wanted to make sure you knew. So that I was hot on your heels. I had no idea what you looked like. Because I, I mean, I didn't. Me neither. I had no idea what yeah. you looked like. So I saw you come around that corner and I didn't know if you were the racer or not. But when you said my name, I was like, that is Jeff. So he's. I thought you questioned whether or not it was me. That In my mind, I, you were saying, are you Jesse? And I was like, yep. And in my mind, I was like, go. Go yeah. now. If you don't go now, Cause he just caught you. He, he put, he, he took it from, you were a mile and a half ahead of him. Of course it took us 12 miles to get through this section. Yeah. 13, whatever. He's now in my mind, 30 seconds behind you. You have to go. This is it. This is what it comes down to. And that's what I did. Yeah. And I never, ever looked back ever. Yeah. Not once just had to push as hard as I could. I was like, he's coming and he's coming. And if I had three different plans as soon as I saw, as soon as we saw each other, my first was you can either run, run is obviously as hard as you can, but still maintain something to keep for a sprint to the end Two, run slower than you want so that he passes you and that you can just slowly maintain the like keep a short gap so that you have a lot of energy for the end with a finishing kick then just finish yeah. hard yeah or 
run all out as hard as you can the whole entire way and whatever happens happens and so yeah. i went with that's I what you did with, <laughs> i went with number three yeah <laughs> Then we hit the road. And again, I had done this part. So you kind of like go under a bridge and then you go up a little hill and then you're on the road and it's flat all the way to the finish. Yeah. And all Derek's I got knew, great footage right there. Of all I knew was that there's a road that crosses the river to get into town. And before we dropped down onto that bike path, I looked up ahead and I could see nothing but canyon walls. Yeah. I was like, we are going to be on this path for a long time. Yeah, like, it oh, does no, feel like a long time, man. Me. That's that. Again, I had run that stretch before, so I would know how it felt. And I remember thinking like, oof, it's if this is going to be a finished sprint, it's going to be a long finished sprint. It would have been, it would have been, a, a, imagine if I had actually, like I said, I would have snuck up on you and caught up with you. What would we, what would we have done? Would we have just literally sprinted? Would we have had a conversation? Like, like, would we have I, said? If I'm in it. And I hadn't seen you on that horseshoe. That horseshoe was critical because I saw yeah. you. And so I put, the, I put the hammer down. Yeah. Yeah. So if you would have come up on me, I think I would have gone with that, uh, with that one plan that I had where I would just maintain the speed that you had. And if you yeah. were the, and if you had the better day and you were faster, so be it. But I would have just maintained that pace and then sprinted for yeah. I would have sprinted for the finish because you would have. Yeah. 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 I would have, I would have, I mean, because but I wouldn't have wanted to like, I, I had this thing about taking a race from somebody like in the final, like 20 meters, like that would have so, felt. Oh, that's, that's like an, I don't know if it's an unwritten rule in ultra running because the yeah. distances are so long. Yeah. But in the film, you show it, I crossed the finish line and I was like, what was that? Why did he have to do that? I was so like, the emotion came over me like, why did he have to try to win? And then I've told so many people that story. And, and if I back up and look at myself going up on from, from second to first place, I would have totally done the same thing, like tried to win. So when I saw you and then you took off, we hit the road. And at that point, I pretty much knew. And again, I thought you had a pacer. I thought there was a guy running with you still. So I'm like, Jesse, he's obviously moving and we're probably just going to hold this. Like I knew it was only a few miles. I pretty much knew I wasn't going to catch you. So I wanted to just keep up to you. And, you know, I was at that point, I was kind of resigned to like, there's no, I'm not going to like literally sprint this to the finish and cross some 20 minutes or 20 meters from the finish line. Like I could see you were actually moving. I could see what they had told me was wrong. You were, you were clearly moving at this point. So, um, so I wasn't, you know, and then I, I caught up at one point with Billy caught up with me and he's like, yeah, he's a quarter mile. So then we kind of slowed down. We're talking. I ran into him with Audrey. So it's funny. Cause at that point you were, when you were approaching the finish line, you were still looking over your shoulder I thinking I was going to, there was, yeah, there was a guy on a bicycle that went the opposite direction of me. And like 30 yeah. seconds later, he came back and he's like, ah, you got it. Good job. And I'm like, really? I was like, there's nobody back there. He's like, no, oh, there's nobody back there. I was like, I don't believe you. I, I said, I'm going as hard as I can. Spit was flying, snot yeah. coming out my nose. I hit the bridge that I'm talking about that brings everybody into town. I still hadn't looked back. I still didn't believe that you weren't right there on my heels. I literally yeah. thought I, it wasn't until I made that corner and I looked back and I didn't see you there and then ran up the little incline that comes up the bridge and I still didn't believe it. Jeff Browning was there as you show that in the film he's right there he's like you got this I was like are you sure are you sure he's really not there and he's like no he's not there I was like oh my god okay finally yeah. I was able to like back off so yeah my finish at Moab I wouldn't have wanted it any other way that was like the best type of finish that could have been like could have been scripted that that good in in my mind for how it went down because to finish something that that long and to have to sprint for the finish was like oh yeah. my god so it like took everything to try to pull muster that together but you know what Achilles tendons didn't hurt once on that on that stretch must have been an adrenaline uh, yeah well adrenaline does funny things right and my my final 10 miles or so of any race are always like my fastest and it's just pure adrenaline when i when i crossed the finish line i felt great and the second i stopped moving my body just like kind of, i was like oh my god my hands were shaking from adrenaline like because it was just i had though 
that final like 20 miles from Porcupine Rim, I had a smile on my face almost the entire time because I was like, this is fun. Like, this is what yeah. real no, racing is like. Absolutely. I'm not usually racing for the front like yeah, that. It was fun. And, and I, I knew the course. I knew Aaron was way behind me. Like at this point, he had he had finished. I mean, he finished three hours behind us. I knew on the tracker he was not coming out of Porcupine Rim anytime soon, or at least he hadn't left yet. And I was like, whatever happens, like I got, I got second. This is fun. I got nothing to lose and everything to gain. So I just like really enjoyed that final 20 miles. It was, yeah. it was, you know, and it's funny now hearing you, like when you said like, why did he try to win? I can see where you were kind of like, why would he try to take that at the end? Yeah, Whereas yeah. to me, it, I felt like I was just doing it incrementally and yeah, it just, we, we were, we were, but we were running at a time. We were running at a time. I needed 10 yeah. more miles. Like yeah. we were doing Cocodona 250 maybe, yeah. you know, exactly. but to be clear, I wouldn't have taken that from you in oh, a final. No, I wouldn't. Why did you to not take it? Well, I would have. If you had I, it in you to take it, I would be more upset with the fact that you didn't, that you backed off and let me win it than you taking it. So just keep that. Here, here's what I would probably have done. If I had caught you and you were like, whoa, like, and we were both at like 98%, I would have probably said, run this in together hard. Like, I wouldn't have tried to like out sprint you for three miles. Yeah, like that would feel gotcha. silly. Yeah. Whereas if I caught you and you were like, dude, I'm done. Like I'm walking. I would have been like, well, look, I've got, I want to, I want to leave it out here. I've got legs left, but I wouldn't have tried to like out sprint you for the last 500 gotcha. meters. That would have yeah. been as much as I think people would have loved to see it. I feel like oh, that would yeah. be kind of, a, be kind of a tacky. It would have been a tacky finish. Total, like it would have been, you know, it would have been a total, like, Oh my God, did you see the finish? Yeah. It was yeah. like that already because I, I heard that before too, because I, Obviously, Billy lives here, and he helped out at one of my wife's races after it. And yeah. um, I, I, oh, I talked to Hillary at one point too uh, on the phone about yeah. some stuff, and she said that that the website had crashed. Yeah, the tracker crashed. From, yeah, from so many views and stuff. So. Yes, people hitting refresh. But I think the way it finished was perfect. My, what I feel like is I, I, I caught you. And then you clearly still had legs. So I, I tested you at that limit. And then it's like, okay, this is Jesse's race. And we both kind of, you know, I chased you in. You sort of were running a little scared at the end there, the last couple well, of miles. Hope you don't mind me saying that. Oh, I was, um, yeah. Yeah, somebody commented on Instagram when I said that, like, how dare you say it? I'm like, no, no, I'm pretty sure he was pretty oh, sure was he was running scared. away from me. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, I, was running, that's... I was running away from you since Geyser. It just wasn't like, it wasn't like, I need to go now. At Geyser. Yeah. But when it was Porcupine, yeah. As soon as Porcupine came, it was go now. Trackers I, out. I yeah. seriously was pushing. It was probably the hardest I pushed during the entire race was from Porcupine in, which is pretty yeah. apparent because you said that you were trying to catch too. So, well, and I also want to just add like pretty yeah. obvious. Well, okay. So a lot of people have said, man, five minutes. If only you could have made it up here or there, you would have probably found I would have found something something too yeah if i had made up 10 minutes you would have made up 10 minutes and i think we saw that at the end there as much as you were suffering you were able to hold pace if not even accelerate at that very final stretch so clearly it, it finished the way it had to and it, it would have finished that way no matter what i think no matter what we would have done differently earlier i think it's probably still would have come down to like this somehow unless you passed me early on from that. way earlier on you would maybe have passed me yeah. early on going down toward porcupine and you mm. put a gap on me, it probably, I probably would have just succumbed to second place because just mentally. I, knew, I knew all the stuff that I had gone through, like yeah, yeah. the Achilles tendons. I yeah. would have gone through that piece on porcupine with the slick yeah. rock. My Achilles tendons would have been hurting. I'd be like, no, yeah. I'm just, I probably have third place be way behind yeah. me. Second place. I was like, it's, that's, that's beautiful. Like just, I came here just to finish it. That would have been my whole mental aspect of it. And you would have definitely, you would have definitely had that win if you would have passed me early on, but so you had too much was, to lose at that point in that yeah, final ten miles. I was so yeah. close to yeah. the finish. I was like, yeah. nope. If he's gonna get this, he's gonna he's gonna have to he's gonna have to, you know, fight to to get it. And that's that's the way I ran the last from aid station to finish. Well, it made for a good story. It made for you know. I, I also again, I just want to stress like that me almost catching you was Jesse Haynes on his, not his worst day, but not his best day <laughs> on your best day. There was no me beating you that, you know what I mean? Like that, or I'm, I'm saying this more for the audience here. Like this yeah. is on Jesse's best day that, you know, so that was what you saw there was sort of an, an anomaly. And that's why I feel so good having come second to you in that race is that it, I think that's the way it should have been. I, I, I really feel like it 
probably, I mean, Aaron ran a great race too, but he probably did. it should have been Jesse Taylor than me, you know, really as far as like chops and, you know, but I know Taylor, you know, his race didn't turn out the way he obviously he wanted it. He ended up dropping. He had the pulmonary edema also. Yeah. And he just didn't, he, he, that's why he was sitting down on the trail. Yeah. He got cold. Pulmonary edema was just too much for him to, yeah. to, uh, to go through. That kind of cough is, um, so Tour de Jean was my first 200 miler in the Italian Alps. And there's like a lot of like big climbs and everybody gets that cough and it's like, it sucks. Like it's, I did have a cough in Moab as well. It just, it wasn't that bad. Like it was something I was, I've often gotten. So I didn't worry too much about it. It wasn't as bad as yours, but that, that is a real, like, man, it affects you. And, and like in tour, you know, you go to these sleep stations and there's all these runners and it's just, everybody's just hacking. Like you can't sleep because everybody's just coughing and like, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's a horrible yeah. feeling. Yeah. It's, it, it, it shuts you down because it just yeah. takes all your oxygen, like yeah. closes off your passageways. Your oxygen can't yeah. get in there. It just yeah. like, exasperates all of your respiratory. It's, 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 it's a bad thing. Well, and I can only feel like maybe it didn't affect me as much because I think maybe I wasn't quite at my upper limit for as long of the race. Whereas I feel like you guys were pushing it more. Yeah. And I noticed that during, during your, your, your film that it just seemed to me like your pacing was, you, you were never like ag agitated is the wrong word. Like you were never just go, you know, I got to get this done. You're always just like, oh, let's, yeah, you know, like not lax about anything, but you just had a great demeanor about you where it was like, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this and this is how it's going to happen. And, you know. I, I can safely say like I ran my own race and I didn't let what others were doing affect me until again, porcupine rim called the last 20 miles. But I think that's where I, I have a lesson to learn there. I, I should have, I should have thrown out the playbook at geyser pass, but um, that's, that's for another day. What are you up to next? You've got a hundred miler coming up. Um, next. Yeah. I've got the, the a race that I have going this year is San Diego 100. Um, and then my wife has the Leona divide 100 mile that she's initiated this year. Uh, and I plan on doing that for training for San Diego. Um, oh. And that's all of the real plans I have as of right now. I kind of would like to go back to Moab uh, at some point just to see to, to see if uh, if I could. So I looked at the tracker and I had 17 hours of no movement time. And I can't figure out where that 17 really? hours came from. Like... So in my mind, I'm like, 17 hours is a lot of time to be not moving. What's and the threshold, I wonder, for speed, you know, of movement? Because that's got to oh, be... sure. Because what if you're at like 30 minute mile and it's saying yeah. you're not you're not moving? Maybe that's, yeah. maybe that's true too. But I just think there's, a, there's quite a bit of time that could be uh, made up on it if yeah. you do it right. Um, yep. So I'd like to do that one. I, I think it's out of the question this year because the lottery's already gone. Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't really have any big plans for the end of the year, but something will come up. I have, I am tough that I would like to try to do, um, yeah. do some other races that I haven't been a part of. Uh, but also uh, there's always, I always have the option of trying to get into a uh, run rabbit. That's always competitive. I just don't know if my competitive nature is uh, going to take me there this year. I don't know what's what's in store for me beyond uh, San Diego. Well, tell tell us about Kira, about your wife and and the races she. So she's directs. uh she's a she uh, owns and designed all the courses for uh, about ten different ultras in Southern California. Uh, a couple big names are the Sean O'Brien, um, Ray Miller is another big one. The largest and longest running one is Leona Divide. Uh, mm -hmm. which, like I just said she put on. She turned that into a hundred miler this, this year. Um, but she's got, you know, races in Griffith park. A lot of the parks, she has a good relationship oh. with a lot of the parks people. So Griffith park in orange County, she's got O'Neill park and Casper's wilderness park and Whiting ranch. Um, but yes, yeah, she's busy, 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 mostly from October to, uh, late May. Is most mm -hmm. of her races she's got them interspersed 
threw out there. But yeah, KH Races is what she, you know, has her website designed to have everybody go to that if, if anybody yeah. wanted to check it out. But she's got some events that carry a lot of uh, a lot of people that sign up for them. So um, they're pretty big in Southern California. Well, we're Audrey and I are going to definitely make it down for one of those Do one day soon. Yeah. But but you and I talked about going out for an adventure one of these days. Yeah, let's figure and, something out. Yeah, uh, Jeff Browning and I have done a couple of those. Only one of them yeah. was filmed, but it was it was super fun. Like yeah. even like I went to Hard Rock this year early, and just going around the Hard Rock doing a couple of the courses like the week before, I had more fun doing that than I did for sure during the during the race because yeah. you know you're with friends and you're hanging out and yeah to get to do an adventure with you would be pretty rad so let's let's plan for something multi-day yeah, for sure for sure definitely let's do day. it yeah 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 we'll do multi-day and and we'll film it and what one thing i didn't ask you about how how was your recovery and how is are you are you totally recovered you, now your I don't achilles think I'm fully recovered no uh uh i uh i mean i've done i've tried three different races meaning tried. I did Sean O'Brien, started the 100K, and she has mm -hmm. the option. I can drop down to a 50 mile. I dropped down to the 50 mile just because I was not, like, my tendons were just still messed up, I feel like. Yeah. I have a friend that did Moab 240, and he said it was a full year before he actually felt yeah. good. But he's not a big racer either. He does, yeah. like, one race a year. <laughs> so yeah. you, you, have to, you have to be in it, like, running every day and everything has to get used to it. So yeah. full recovery, I don't think has happened yet. I actually have from the cough from yeah. the pulmonary edema. I feel like I tore something in my throat because there's always a spot in my throat that to this day still hurts. And it goes like from my throat into my ears. I don't know oh, if man. that's from coughing or if I tore something or what. Um, I've got a problem with like my nose feels like inside my nose. Um, infection or something? It would, like I from clearing my nose too much. Yeah. Uh, cause I was getting nosebleeds as well when I was down there, not during the race, but before, um, and I, I was, so I was trying to be really careful, but the dryness affected my nose as well. Like it feels almost like, um, like I'm, uh, missing some skin inside my nose or something. That's like, exactly what it feels yeah. like in my throat. Like there's yeah. something torn in there or something, but other than that, I feel great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, thanks for your time, man. I, I really appreciate you doing this and, um, yeah, we'll, we'll connect. So for everybody watching this, hopefully in the next oh. call it year or so, we'll, we'll get some footage of Jesse and I doing something, some kind of I adventure. Wanted, I want to, get to know say him better. something yeah. is, um, in Southern California. So I've been racing quite a while and I'm not trying to say this, like, look at me, I'm just saying, I would think most people in this, in the area down here, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they might know who I am. A couple of the races that are that they're like hey you're the guy that won moab i'm like yeah they're like yeah when i was watching this this guy that i follow jeff uh i i, I, I watch his videos and 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 you were on there in, in his video or you had mentioned something and i was like there's more people in southern california that are that know about the Moab 240 and me winning it because not because they know me but because they know you i was like that's that's crazy. Not like, not that it's crazy. I'm just like thinking to myself, yeah, you, you have, a, you actually have some really dedicated followers. That's really cool to see. Well, it's the, it's the power of storytelling and social media. And again, that's where like, I try to use that to highlight athletes like yourself. Cause like it's guys like you that inspire me. Um, I, I'm not as fast as you were at 42, but I hope that I can still, do stuff like this in eight years. I mean, that's, that would be amazing to go back to Moab 240. Again, well, not that you what. 50 is old, but I mean, like, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible what you're doing. You continue to do, and you've been doing it for so long. Yeah. I think you're just on a trajectory right now. Look at, you know how to get up there <laughs> to the front now and, and run at the front. Maybe, so maybe. Now, yeah. now it's going to be in that site. I'm a, I'm a late bloomer. Gonna, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're not going to be <laughs> back there in the back of the, in the that's right. in the back, but the middle of the <laughs> middle of the front pack going, yeah, they're up there, but big deal. Now you're going to be yeah. like, oh, they're up there, but I could probably catch them. Maybe, maybe. Yeah.